Good morning. Um, I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, my name's Ann Morgan. I'm the chair of the Toronto Police Services Board. I'd like to welcome you all to this hybrid uh, meeting of the board. Um, <coughs> I'd like to continue with our Indigenous land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the land we are on as we hold this meeting is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And it's now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. The board also acknowledges that Toronto's uh, covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Williams Treaties, and signed with multiple Mississauga and Chippewa bands. <coughs> and now I'd like to ask, are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflicts of Interest Act? Seeing none, um, let me proceed. Um, the first order of business is I would like to uh, proudly announce that the board has selected Dr. Doobie Canningisser as our new executive director. And Dr. Canningisser was previously the board's senior advisor of strategic analysis and governance. In his um, previous role, Dr. Canningisser supported the board's governance and oversight functions by ensuring the board has access to the best, most relevant information and analysis, and by conducting ongoing evaluation of the board and the services achievement of adequacy standards and other priorities. Um, I said in his previous role, he's still doing all that work too, but. <laughs> and Dr. Kanegisser uh, has a PhD in political science from the University of Toronto, where he studied process of social change and their impact on democratic institutions. With a background in research and evaluation, he previously worked with the provincial government supporting evidence-based decision-making at the Ministry of Health and at Cabinet Office. Dr. Kanegisser immigrated to Canada from Israel, where he worked in the non-governmental sector with a leading human rights organization. He's recently been involved in the policy development of a number of complex and keyboard policies, including those dealing with artificial intelligence, use of force, and body-worn cameras. Dr. Kanegisser is an astute, progressive and bright professional with a sophisticated understanding of police governance. His vast experience in policy development evaluation, along with his genuine commitment to the importance of meaningfully incorporating the voices of our stakeholders and the public, make him an ideal choice to lead our board staff. Dr. Kanegisser will be filling a position vacated by Mr. Ryan Teschner who was appointed as Ontario's Inspector General of Policing, as we all know, in February of this year. Um, the selection of Dr. Canningisser was made by a selection panel, included all the board members in con consultation uh, with Ryan Teschner and also with Chief Demq. Um, I'm a few words of my own, uh, so very grateful. As you can hear from Doobie's background, it's not mine. <laughs> and all his astute evidence-based approach helps me with uh, my litigation approach. So I think we make a good team. And um, I uh, heartily welcome Dr. Canningisser, and I'm, I'm very grateful uh, that he's taken on the new role of executive director. So just a <laughs> And now, Dr. Duby, I'll ask you to uh, um, go over the meeting's logistics. <laughs> thank you, Anne, and thank you, everyone. And if I may say thank you also, especially to uh, the staff of the board office, who's been incredibly supportive and, and put their faith in me. So uh, I really appreciate that. Um, thank you to everyone who has joined us in person, as well as those who have called into these, this meeting. Please note that this meeting is also being live streamed on the Toronto Police YouTube account and will be available there at the conclusion of this meeting. Joining us in person, we have Chair Ann Morgan, Vice Chair Francis Nunziata, uh, Member Lisa, Lisa Kostakis, Member Nick Migliori, Councillor Lily Chang, Councillor Vincent Crisanti, is he here? Okay. And uh, Member Nadine Spencer. 
Uh, we also have members of our board office staff, Chief DemQ, members of the command team, members of the service, and of course, members of the public. We have individuals who have registered to make deputations, both in person as well as virtually, on our agenda items. And as per our regular meeting process, deputations will be heard prior to the item being discussed and voted on by board members. When it comes time to do a deputation, those who have registered will be called upon and or brought into the meeting by our colleague, Daniel Dowdy. And as always, deputants will speak, followed by an opportunity for board members to ask them questions. Chair. Thank you. Um, at, at this point, um, sadly, at many of our board meetings, we appear to be spending time reflecting on the loss of heroes in the line of duty, um, all the men and women who tragically lost their lives, <coughs> keeping us safe. But we also have other uh, living colleagues who keep us safe, and that's um, our horses from the mounted unit and also our dogs from the canine unit. So at this time, I'd just like to say a few words about the tragic passing of the Toronto Police Service dog, Bingo, who was tragically killed Tuesday evening, responding to a call with his handler, Sergeant Brandon Smith. Sergeant Smith and his canine partner, Bingo, of Police Dog Services, we're in the Kipling and Dixon Road area searching for an armed suspect. It's alleged that during a search of the area, the sub, uh, suspect shot and killed Bingo. In addition, it is alleged the suspect was also shot by the police. This is now a special investigation unit investigation, and at the present time, of course, we can only release very limited details. Um, Bingo, as you can see on the screen, was only two years old, uh, a German Shepherd who joined police dog services in July 2022 after undergoing a comprehensive, very intensive 16-week training with his handler, Sergeant Smith. Uh, the bond between a police dog and handler is unique and extremely powerful. We offer our deep and sincere condolences to Sergeant Smith, along with Bingo's entire family at uh, PDS. We join Torontonians in grieving the tragic loss of Bingo, and we honor his incredible loyalty, dedication to duty, and his ultimate sacrifice in that he kept us safe. At this time, I would ask we stand and just take a moment of silence to honor the life and tragic passing of Bingo. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> and now I will go through the agenda items. Um, agenda item one is the confirmation of the minutes from our last meeting in June 2023. Um, we have uh, deputations on that, so we'll hold that matter down. Um, <coughs> sorry. Just a sec. Sorry, when people print two-sided, I'm... <laughs> Number one, I'm a lefty. <laughs> I need two. <laughs> yeah. Page two. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, <coughs> um, item five, uh, or sorry. No, I know, I'm looking, look. oh, I see, I'm sorry. Um, item three uh, is a presentation. Uh, we'll hold down for Auditor General recommendations. Um, I, yeah, item two, uh, we will hold down. It is a uh, presentation on search warrants and we have to hold that item down. Sorry, it's because the clown yeah. was whistling. Thank you. It's okay. Thank you. Item four, again, per, titled Professionalism and Accountability. There are a number of uh, both virtual 
uh, an in-person deputation, so we'll hold that matter down. Item five is um, a presentation, um, and we will hold that down. Item six is um, <coughs> a city uh, council decision. Um, it is pedestrian safety on Avenue Road and Bloor Street to St. Clair West. Um, it's in your materials. Can I have a motion to approve? Uh, uh, Councillor Nick Migliori, seconded by Councillor Crisanti. All in favor? No one opposed? Carried. Item seven <coughs> is um, uh, a memorandum, a report from uh, Doobie Cannon Gisser. It is with respect to the City Council decision, the sustainability uh, city of the Toronto Fleets Pan. Can I have a motion to approve? Councilor Kis or, uh, Member Kostakis, seconded by Member Spencer. All in favor? Seeing no, no disapproval, carried. Item eight is the um, <coughs> 2024 Budget Committee. You have the report in your materials. Can I have a motion? Member Spencer, seconded by Member Crisanti. All in favor? Thank you. Number nine is a report from the chief as it relates to automatic license place recognition. You have the report in your materials. Can I have a motion? Uh, Council, or, uh, um, Member Kostakis, uh, approved by um, Member uh, Spencer. All in favor? Thank you. And the next one is item 10. Um, we will we'll, uh, we will hold that down. Uh, there will be a presentation. <laughs> Item 11 is um, a report from Chief Demke as it relates to special constable appointments and reappointments. July 2023. May I have a motion to approve? Uh, count, um, Member uh, Migliori, seconded by um, Councillor Chang. All in favor? Seeing none opposed, <laughs> that motion's carried. Uh, the next is item 12. It's a memorandum from uh, Doobie Cannon Kisser as it relates to uh, a report uh, that um, uh, member uh, Nadine Sensor will now uh, replace me on the uh, Toronto <coughs> Police Services Board represented at, on the Canadian Association of Police Governance. Uh, may I have a motion to receive that report? Um, member uh, Migliori, seconded by um, Member Kostakis, carried. Next uh, report is item 13 from the Chief. It is um, the annual report as it relates to recruitment, appointments, promotions, secondments, secondary activities, and cumulatively legal costs for Labor Relations Council and leave, leave <coughs> legal indemnification. May I have a motion to receive? Councillor Crisanti, seconded by Member um, <coughs> Kostakis, all in favor? Seeing none opposed, carry. Um, item 14 is uh, from Doobie Cannon Gisser. Uh, it's the Toronto Police Services Special Board Fund. It's the annual specified procedures report for year end ending December 31st, 2022. May I have a motion to receive? Um, <coughs> have a motion from um, Nadine Spencer, seconded by. Um, Member uh, Migliori, all in favor, uh, carried uh, to receive. The next items are um, items from the Chief's Administrative Investigative Reports, items 15.1 through to 15.8, uh, as they relate to um, <coughs> uh, uh, complaints. Um, um, may I have a motion to receive? Um, Member Kostakis, seconded by Member um, Councillor Crisanti, all in favor? Thank you. Seeing no opposed, um, that is carried. And then perhaps we can go back now to the beginning of the agenda. Um, item number five um, <coughs> is, a, is a presentation um, uh, from uh, Dil Nasgarda, who's the president of Beyond the Blue. Um, <clears throat> May I have a motion so that we can uh, have that uh, uh, presentation before the Chief's uh, monthly report? Uh, member Kostakis, second by um, Council, uh, Member uh, Migliori. Um, all in favor? 
and I wonder if at this time uh, we can welcome um, um, Dil Nasgarda, the president of Beyond uh, the Blue, who's going to give us a, a presentation. Perhaps you can, uh, get, uh, even though I've uh, uh, met you before, give us a, an introduction to both of you, if you could, please, and welcome. Yes, of course. Um, so this is Crystal Jones, and she's the president of the Toronto chapter, Toronto Beyond the Blue. And I'm Dilna Garda, and I'm the president of the national organization, Canada Beyond the Blue. Um, so we've got a slide deck for you today. Thank you, Danielle. Um, so our beginning actually started, um, we came together when my brother, who was a Toronto constable, uh, Darius PC Garda, um, was involved in a fatal shooting with a few other subject officers. Um, on his journey to, through the process, um, and then the, into the coroner's process, um, he developed PTSD and other mental health issues. Um, he died by suicide. Um, and that was kind of when our journey began because in helping my brother navigate the system um, in getting help and trying to get help, I realized how overwhelming it is for a person who has their mental health intact, let alone someone struggling with their mental health, to work through processes and papers and policies and all the various stakeholders that you have to communicate with just to get your paperwork filled. Um, my family felt alone, um, we felt embarrassed um, and isolated, o only until the funeral to realize that actually in the condolence line, many officers were struggling and chose to verbalize that struggle, um, thinking we'd understand. I spoke to as many stakeholders as I could following the months of his passing, the Ministry of Labor, Labor every, everyone I could, I spoke to them to share the story. I also had to make a decision, and the decision was to channel my grief into something positive, because grief can very quickly turn you into a very toxic, anger, angry person. Um, there was no sense in pointing any fingers because if I was to do so, I felt very strongly that the finger would be pointed back at me first as a sister to take care of him. And, um, and so we, um, we co-founded Beyond the Blue because we realized that if we waited and did it through other channels, sometimes systems can take very long. And we know that the cost is either you're, you're dead or you're divorced. Um, sometimes both. So, <laughs> you know, we didn't want anything to stand in the way, especially when it came to red tape, to get um, the help needed for our police members and our police families. So that was our beginning. And then Crystal's going to take over and share what we do um, in our mandate and mission. Mm -hmm. So we're very proud um, as a national organization, which Toronto, our chapter, is a part of. Um, we represent the voice of police families. We understand the joy and the, the pride that comes with the job, um, but we also understand the hardships and grief and loss and what our families face. So it is a great honor that we carry those titles. We pride ourselves on promoting advocacy raising awareness, talking about things that are really difficult to talk about, and normalizing those conversations so that people don't feel alone. We also provide a lot of education. Our education is very much police cultured. Um, we work with uh, clinicians to ensure that they understand what, what our lives are like. We open up, we kind of pull the curtain back and let them in so that they know how to help families like ours. Um, that's a very important piece. We, we vet all of our clinicians. We make sure that everybody that we put a Toronto police family in front of or any police family in, in our country um, has a very unique set of skills that we know it's the right fit. Uh, we provide a lot of um, programming that is emotionally focused, uh, clinically and empirically sound. 
Um, we have communication retreats where we help couples, police couples, uh, work on intimacy and communication because the home life is what keeps people healthy and what really helps our officers um, when something is wrong, knowing that they have a partner who understands and knowing that their partner has somewhere to turn, which is us, we're beyond the blue, uh, to provide them with the best and most effective intervention that is required. This is just a testimonial of one of uh, the TPS officers. We help on average, um, I wanna say about 100 police officers a year. A lot of the time then they call us, sometimes it's you know problems with their own mental health, um, sometimes it's for their families, sometimes it's for their children. But it is something that when we started on this journey, we were very much, you know, operational stress injury focused and post-traumatic stress injuries because that's a lot of what our families deal with. But we began to very quickly realize that a lot of the spouses were living with vicarious trauma, compassion fatigue, burnout. So we had to really um, expand our, our, our net to really capture um, the full experience of the police family. And this is just one of the many testimonials that we've received from people where they felt alone, isolated, they turned to us and we gave them a community uh, and we gave them vetted, trusted resources that could get them to the next chapter of their lives, which was recovery. So these are just part of our resources offered. Um, I briefly discussed some of the education and programming, the advocacy work that we do. We have an ongoing peer support program, um, which is attended. We offer it for uh, uniform members, and then we also offer um, family sessions. We offer group sessions, and we offer one-to-one -one sessions. Um, I'm one of the, the senior peer support people on the team, and we do, on average, um, I personally have done 28 suicide interventions this year for Toronto police officers. And part of our, our training, um, all of our peer supporters are trained in assist. They're trained in safe talk. Uh, we have our own peer support program that has been established uh, based on the clinical recommendations and the standards in British Columbia. Um, it's something that we take very seriously and it's one of our most utilized resources that we offer. Our social events and fundraising, they kind of go hand in hand. Our social events though are, are what allows us to foster a community of support, which allows us to really deepen the trust in our brand um, and allow people a safe place to turn when they don't know what to do or who to talk to about what they're seeing at home when they have concerns. Fundraising is how we pay for the work that we do. We don't have any paid positions within our organization. We all are police families. We are career people of our own. We do this because it's, it's something that we wholeheartedly believe in. We believe in the power of our passion and our lived experience in helping people like us not feel so alone and isolated um, because we know what that's like. We've, we've lived it. And fundraising, we offer um, a number of ways of fundraising. And I think the next slide is actually the fundraising mm -hmm. slide. Yeah, oh, okay. sorry. And you know what, we can, uh, just to, for the sake of time, time. Uh, the slide deck we, we take a lot of pride in, but we'll, we'll move past the testimonials. I think that's something you can read on your own time. Um, we, you know, we just want to ensure that you have the voice of the membership that we're serving through the testimonials. So next slide and then the slide after. So these are some of the campaigns that you may remember uh, that we spearheaded and we're very proud of. The, the mental health epaulets were a significant revenue generator for our organization that really allowed us to set ourselves up for the year. Um, we would like to bring that back because uh, it, it was um, stopped for the last couple of years, but we would like to bring that back. But the challenge coin is another one. And uh, during COVID, we very quickly pivoted all of our stuff to online and we ran uh, get home safe kits, which were very successful. But these are dollar for dollar. 
all the money that goes into um, our fundraising, it goes right back into police families. So it's police people supporting other TPS people. And it, it is really just a beautiful thing. It's kind of what keeps me going when um, it, it's, a, it's a big role. And it, it's... And one of the best parts about the epaulettes was it's a visible um, campaign. Um, we have the civilian equivalent for the for you know because they don't wear the uh, uniforms. Epaulets. So we had epaulets going, and this was a very BTB um, centric thing. Other neighboring services engaged in it. So then you had a national May Mental Health Month where um, everyone from uh, you know whether it's a PC and we had senior leadership wearing epaulets. And the idea was, you know, you're wearing them to show that you're a safe person to turn to and believe in mental health, and you're not going to get ridiculed or, um, you know, belittled. And and it's just such a powerful thing because whenever we run a campaign, while we generate revenue, um, it's nominal, right? Like, I mean, it's enough to set us up for some of the things, but it's not our primary focus. It's awareness. So then, word of mouth comes to be. So there's a lot of back end work. As soon as we are, you know, um, committed to running a campaign. We have to ensure all our peer supporters are set up because then we're going to get disclosures. People are going to call in. People are going to text. Um, on our website, you have a variety of opportunities. Mm -hmm. You can text. You can email. You can call. Whatever your safe preference approach is to communicating and getting help, we we you know allow for that. We remove a lot of the barriers, the barriers to seeking yeah. help. Next slide, please. Okay, so. Um, Something that I've trying that I've been trying to do on a systems level is um, look at a suicide memorial. So there's been a very kind of divisive conversation around um, in line of duty deaths, and Canada Beyond the Blue has coined because of the line of duty deaths because you serve um, the mental health and the toll of the job. Um, you know, m when it ends in suicide, it's unfortunate. What we want to honor is the way that they lived and served. So um, that has been a passion of ours, is to uh, look at constructing a memorial that is separate from the in-line of duty deaths. And a primary reason for that as well is when someone dies in line of duty, the Ministry of Labor comes in, services come in, and they look at what policies and procedures can they change to ensure that this type of death, that they can assure the officer's safety, that this type of death does not happen again. That separation for this memorial, what we're hoping for, does the same thing at a policy and procedure level. Like, what is happening in our services that is causing suicides? Is there something we can do to get in front of it? Um, from that, we've also, we're a very proactive organization. Um, reaction is one thing and you have to be ready for it, but we're proactive. And the Champions of Change Gala is something that we decided was necessary and not done before. We wanted to celebrate and recognize mental health champions. So those that are um, running initiatives within their service um, to promote mental health um, initiatives or awareness. And so we wanted to recognize them. We had our inaugural gala last year, uh, over 35 nominees, five different categories. We find this to be an incredible night, um, unlike any other gala that's usually, you know, so we're very proud of that because the stories are incredibly personal. Um, our goal, though, with the revenue stream there is to fund our national programs, but also um, earmark it for the memorial. And so um, that's a little bit about the Champions of Change gala. I don't know if we need to add to that, if I've missed anything on that. Yeah. And in this year, I mean, we've got all the major and minor services and associations. I was so proud last year to have a Commissioner Karik stand up and speak. And the one thing that he said that resonated in my heart was that he's never looked in a room to see various leaders together, you know, sometimes. I mean, the service and associations work well together, but sometimes, you know. Um, and it was just a really proud moment for him because everyone was there for a common goal. They all believed in member wellness and member mental health. Um, and that's what we strive to do too. It's, it's heartwarming to see all stakeholders coming together for a common purpose and goal. That's our presentation. Yeah, yeah that we're gonna pass, I guess. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, both Dilnez and, and Crystal. I had the uh, pleasure to actually have a pretty heartfelt one-on-one -on -one with Dilnez and 
it, it's nice to meet you, uh, Crystal. I just had one question. I'm sure the chief and others have some comments. Um, given the present climate where there's um, not only increased scrutiny on police officers, um, you know, the, um, the pressures of responding given, you know, the resource constraints, the, sa the whole safety issue, uh, you know, officers who now have been either injured or have been actually killed in the line of duty, are you seeing um, an increase in the demand for your services just um, not only from the families of those folks who have suffered, but from other members who find it maybe a terrifying thing to go out day to day, especially the younger members. Yes, sorry, so you're asking what is, how has that impacted our organization? <laughs> um, certainly, you know, what we, what we pride ourselves on is, and this is every chapter, is being at arm's length from the service and association. And we do that very purposefully. You know, it was a lesson learned from my brother that um, there's this paranoia that exists uh, to ensure that when you come forth that you're going to have anonymity um, because you want to travel this journey um, with discretion. And so, you know, with the uptick of mental health and scrutiny from the media, we are finding, like Crystal said, you know, sometimes it's not that extreme PTSD or not that extreme suicide. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just that day-to-day -day piece. Um, you know, sometimes grief takes us, and when there was uh, the Simcoe deaths, uh, we had to, we were mobilized instantly because many of the family members, you know, it's in the back of your mind what your police officer does, but we like to keep it there. This became very real. So we had to deal with anxieties there. Um, we certainly see the uptick um, now more than ever, um, for sure, and I think it will consistently stay there. I, I think also what happens is when you provide methods, when you eliminate barriers and provide those resources and supports, you know, I, I, I sometimes question the data too because then we say there's an uptick. But sometimes when you just provide the opportunity, that's when you have people coming forward. It probably already existed, they just never came forward. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm thoroughly answering your question, but yeah. No, I, I appreciate uh, your comments. And I, I think the chief had either a question or comment and then followed by Vice Chair Nunziana. Chief? All right, um, Vice Chair Nunziana. Yeah, just a couple questions. Uh, first of all, the gala is sort of a fundraiser, right? That's. It's twofold, yes. I mean, we raise funds from it, yeah. but it's definitely an awareness as well. I think all our things are. Half okay. And half, yeah. So, how is the working relationship between a Toronto Beyond the Blue and, and, and in the services wellness unit? And are there any joint projects or initiatives that address members' um, support? Mm -hmm. Would that be a question for you or for Steph? Uh, it could be for both of us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then maybe we'll compare notes. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, there's definitely a wellness unit, and um, we've always welcomed the opportunity to work with the wellness unit. Um, there's not been any collaborations to date. Um, yeah. So I'll, add, um, I'll, I'll maybe offer sort of... Uh where we're currently at so we, we do have a we have a positive relationship with beyond the blue i think the the benefit that um dylan has raised around the organization being at arm's length i think is a very key distinction what we ultimately strive to do is have all doors open to our members so there's kind of a whole set of wellness supports that are internal to the service but there's also peer support external and so beyond the blue is one of many very good organizations we're lucky that are kind of part of the broader system and so to the degree there's information sharing um, it's not consistent but certainly there's ties kind of and a recognition that we kind of have our roles okay. just one last question so how many how many members do you have sorry do you mean members as yeah. in who we serve or yes. on our team <clears throat> yeah who we serve um, so we in have Toronto? we have in Toronto right now just through um, people who've been signed up and vetted, we have roughly 3,500 people. Yeah. 
Um, we have over 7,000 people in our following. Um, we have we have so many people also where, because we don't require you to sign up to access some pretty basic information, um, I can tell through analytics when I review, um, when I do some strategic planning on, on what I should be focusing on and what we should be developing. Um, I look at our analytics and I, I, use, I use that data in order to make decisions to inform wh where I'm going to focus next. And I will say, you know, a lot of the resources that are significantly accessed are, you know, the vetted clinicians, which is 97% of the people who access our site are looking at our clinicians. Um, and that's over thousands of hits on that page. Um, and then we have you know, occasionally they'll go to the store or they'll do some of our digital downloads that we do, which is our um, get home safe con uh, cards and our mental health continuum. Um, but overall, you know, because we don't require them to become members in order to seek support, um, we just will figure that out as we get go along in the journey because there is that rapport building that has to take place and they, ne they do need to know that they can trust us, um, which is something that I honor very deeply. But uh, yeah, we have a we have a very significant following, and our membership is is substantial, and it grows right. all the time. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your thank presentation. You. Um, um, Member Kostakis has a question. Uh, just quickly, thank you very much for the presentation and for sharing as well, and the vulnerability and and our uh, deepest condolences as well for your losses and turning this into and being a social worker by trade in the last 35 years, I totally appreciate and see the challenges too within our systems and navigating the systems as well yeah. in supporting and advocating uh, and providing those services. Do you have um, any other funding through different levels of government um, that you've accessed or? Nope. And do you have anyone that would be supportive of that or advocate with you to assist you in accessing any of that funding? Nope. And, okay, that'd be great because, I mean, um, <clears throat> our team, like we said, are all volunteers and we have to really be mindful of where we disperse um, our efforts. Grant writing is a great buzzword, but the amount that it takes to grant write, and so thank you for understanding <laughs> and we will connect. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to thank you for your work. I think to see the whole officer, um, not just the person, but the family behind the officer, I, uh, I feel like you know that recognition, I'm sure you've helped many families to stay intact. Uh, when stress hits, it's the family that often um, has to go through it, so to know that they have a pathway to support is so important. Um, I noticed in your slide deck that advocacy is one of the pieces that you're working on, and I'm just wondering, you know, what is the what are the biggest changes that you would like to see? Um, what are you advocating for that could really improve the lives of uh, of our police services? So. Yeah, that's a great question, and I think I can answer that on two levels. One is a system level, and one is, um, on a system level, I've always had a really good rapport with each chief. Um, they know me to be incredibly frank, but respectful. Um, and so it will be going to the board or to the chief, closed doors, and being very frank about what we see. Like, here's where policies and procedures are failing, Here's where your members are hurting. Here's where different units need different things. And that advocacy is um, incredibly powerful because how many of you get the opportunity to go right to the top, have that conversation, have it in a frank manner? Um, and I think I'm afforded that simply because they know that, one, my brother died and, um, and people are dying. So this is, this is no longer a joke, and as much as everyone in this room has to be diplomatic, I kind of don't, mm -hmm. and it's fantastic. Um, and they also know that I'm there in, in very sincere, for sincere reasons. Mm -hmm. So that has been one level of advocacy, has been that. And I've had chiefs call me. Um, you know, one of the suicides, I'll never forget, Saunders uh, tweeted 
And again, he used language and I texted him like, that's the wrong language. <laughs> I mean, he's in the middle of this. He's in the thick of it. And he picks up the phone and is like, okay, what's the language? Right? Um, same with Raymer. You know, it's been, um, here's a communique that's going out. This, we just lost this member. I need your eyes on it. I need, you know, and it's, and it's these things that are so important um, in, the, in a fantastic working relationship. Uh, so happy that Chief Demick Hughes at the helm at this point um, has reached out to say, let's book a meeting, like let's talk. We, you know, want those same open channels. Uh, those are really important advocacy pieces. On a case to case, we're the people that will be the voice of the voiceless. So if if I need to get at wellness, hey wellness, you know, blah blah blah, okay. And Sabina's great. Okay, we're going to come back to you, you know? Um, if I need to contact a supervisor, if I need to contact the association, if I'm like, this is not getting done, you guys. And they just are burned out and exhausted. Um, we end up calling the systems or the stakeholders that need to get it together because this person's on the brink. And, and, and like, I'm not trying to dramatize this. And, and there's a lot of things that we deal with that people just aren't aware of. Um, you know, and, and I can share story after story of, you know, cops, you know, whenever you go to a cocktail party, the cops always ask for their story, right? And it's like, but I can unfortunately share stories of those kinds of things where our members are hurting. Our officers need to be healthy if you want them to serve the community in a healthy manner as well. So those would be the two levels of advocacy. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds like in your role and your organization, a curtain is pulled back on uh, the inner life of people who have to be so brave on the surface but may have really deep struggles and you're able to be their voice. That's so important. Um, and how can you know we as the board support your work better? Like what how would you see that um, support? I think that the board again I'm really grateful i think we've just had some really good people um in that position um like chair morgan already said you know i had a great conversation with her um she got to know me as as the frank person that i am but i just think it just ends up being really productive so i think allowing us if there's ever a time that you want to fact check something that you want to pulse on something email us text us call us um let us in so that we can really give you a good pulse on the mental health of, of your people, right? It's shared people. Mm -hmm. And we can tell you what are the upticks, what are we seeing, what are the current issues, where are the, where are the gaps, where are the successes, what can we celebrate that we are doing great as, um, you know, a service and as an employer. Yeah, we're happy to share it all. But I think just the open lines of communication and this feels very welcoming. So, you know, there are times when we don't feel welcomed. It's like, listen, we'll just do our own thing. We're fine. Um, this is a very welcoming board and we're happy for that. We're grateful for that. Am I? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for everything you do Thank and you. how you turned your grief into something very powerful and changing lives as a result. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Chief, you were going to speak. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, let me start by thanking you both uh, for coming today, continuing your advocacy, for sharing a difficult and powerful story that, uh, frankly, galvanizes all of us together in a common purpose to help our membership deal with uh, what are often difficult days and difficult times and moments. And again, I'll speak later this meeting about the difficulty our organization is facing uh, with a loss. Um, I, I Chair, I think uh, I really want to amplify the importance of this work as a continuum of care and a suite, uh, a, a series of uh, uh, elements of care available to our membership. Uh, there is no one-size-fits-all. We do need all doors open. This is a very important door that needs to be kept open to support our membership. And I speak, Chair, uh, not from an abstract position. I speak from a position of uh, having met many members who have struggled, who have found a path, and uh, sometimes they don't find a path. And we need to make sure 
that every available resource uh, can be brought to bear so that uh, Dylan S and I do not have to have phone calls as we have in the last few months. Yeah. So I really want to make sure we, we just take a moment and reflect on how important this work is to our members, for our members, uh, and the value it brings. And uh, I do want to comment on a couple of things you spoke of in your presentation. Uh, first of all, uh, how to memorialize our members who have died because of the line of duty is very much an ongoing conversation <clears throat> that I'm having with the Ontario Human Rights Commission presently, and we'll make sure that uh, your voice is heard um, through, those, uh, through those efforts. And you mentioned the epaulets. I do want to commit to you, Chair, and the Board, and to you. Uh, we have changed the governance framework as it relates to the wearing of epaulets recently, and we'll be in touch to make sure that uh, we can find a path through our present governance framework to ensure that uh, what you spoke of, uh, we can, we can uh, acknowledge uh, the importance of the month of May uh, through uh, the symbolic wearing of our epaulets. So with that, Chair, I'll just say again, thank you so very much for your continued advocacy, and, and I gotta tell you as the Chief, I have to thank you for being available uh, when I need it. Being available to guide and to listen and to support, uh, because sometimes uh, we all need that kind of support, and of course, uh, you've always been there. So I, I really appreciate you, and thank you. Thank you both, uh, Dilnaz and, and Crystal. Um, you not even only uh, uh, support and have a, a very specific um, organization that has specific skills and can offer specific um, types of resources. Um, I, from talking to you, I know that uh, as Crystal just uh, mentioned, um, speaking to people, uh, you save lives. And uh, it's not just only in the area of, of preventing suicides, but uh, keeping people, families together, um, keeping people able to work, keeping people afloat, and, and all these uh, myriad of um, uh, consequences from working in this, in this type of a, a job. So I, I thank you so much and the board does uh, support you and thank you for coming today and at this point i'd like to uh to I'll, the... I'll move the recommendation thank you <laughs> okay i wish it was more than five thousand yeah and we're having that discussion and we, <laughs> and, and uh and Dil dilnaz knows but um you know things things do change post covid yeah. resources change and as you know um, we had a, a heartfelt talk, and uh, as the chief said, we have a, a, um, an extraordinary commitment to you and understand uh, profoundly what it is the work you do, and, and so thank you again, both of you. Yeah. Okay, second. Thank you. And then Thank you. And, I mean, beyond the money, it would, it would mean everything to us if the board could find time on that date to attend the gala and to really get a sense of not just what Toronto, uh, we have Toronto nominees, um, but what Ontario as officers yeah, are doing. So thank you for that. Can you remind us of the date, please? Yes, I will send the invite, but it's uh, September 14th. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um. <clears throat> I was going to ask the chief for his update. <laughs> so item five uh, is carried. Um, and I'll... Can I do something now? Okay. Thank you, Chief. At this point, um, um, are, are you uh, ready to do your monthly update? I am, Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. Chair, as you spoke of on Tuesday night, we lost a member of our police family when police dog service, dog Bingo, was shot and killed in the line of duty. Bingo was not only a valuable member of our service, but he was a partner and a family member of his handler, Sergeant Brendan Smith. Bingo joined our service just over one year ago 
He completed over 16 weeks of incredibly extensive training alongside Sergeant Smith and graduated in December of 2022 before being deployed to serve and protect our communities. Since his deployment just eight months ago, Bingo and Sergeant Smith enjoyed an incredible success apprehending suspects, and uh, these are suspects that committed violent crimes, as well as locating valuable evidence associated to criminal offenses. Just two days ago, Bingo, Sergeant Smith, and members of our emergency task force, and members from many units, put themselves in harm's way when they arrested a suspect in a recent homicide. Tragically, it was during the arrest of this suspect that Bingo was killed in the line of duty. I have no doubt that on Tuesday night, Bingo's actions saved others from being harmed. And in his final act of bravery, he located and participated in the arrest of a homicide suspect. Bingo's tragic death is a first for our service as we've never had a police service dog shot and killed in the line of duty. He will forever be remembered as a hero, a partner, and a valued member of our Toronto Police Service family, and of course, Sergeant Smith's family. Earlier today, this morning, I joined members of the service, <clears throat> and we formed an honor guard to pay our respects to Bingo as he was carried out of Veterinary Emergency Clinic on Young Street by members of our police dog service unit, including Sergeant Smith and his family. Bingo was then placed in the back of a police vehicle one last time <clears throat> and driven to his final resting place. This emotional and well-attended procession this morning was a clear indication of just how devastating Bingo's death has been for all of our members, and I can't even imagine how hard this must be for Sergeant Smith and his family. On behalf of the entire command team, I extend our sincere and heartfelt condolences to Sergeant Smith and his family, our members at Police Talk Services, and every member of our service, as well as members of the board and our extended policing family across North America who are grieving with us during this difficult time. I want to take this opportunity to thank the board, the residents of Toronto, and our extended policing family for the incredibly overwhelming outpouring of support and messages of condolences. And this morning, we did see also members of the public gather with us during that difficult walk. We are all devastated that Bingo was killed in the line of duty and appreciate all the support we're receiving during this difficult time and will require that support in the coming days. This past Saturday, we also had a 14 Division officer struck by a driver of a stolen vehicle while executing her duties on a bicycle. The officer suffered significant injuries, was treated at hospital, and is currently recovering at home. Having seen video myself and having visited the officer in the hospital, I can tell you that we are very fortunate that the injuries aren't more serious. This week highlights the dangers our members face every single day in the course of their duties while protecting Torontonians. I also want to thank and acknowledge the incredible investigators of traffic services who worked very hard to advance this investigation and have arrested two young offenders. On Thursday, July 6th, uh, earlier this summer at approximately 12.20 p.m., police responded to a call of a stabbing that had occurred on Eglinton Station on board a TTC subway car. This incident, as we know, received a significant amount of media attention and public interest was elevated. And I'll say rightfully so, given that a violent crime had taken place within our public transportation system. This incident resulted in a substantial number of service resources being deployed to not only provide reassurances to members of our communities, but to also ensure that a quick apprehension of the suspect was achieved. In the days following the stabbing, 
Moses Lewin, 25 years of age, of no fixed address, was apprehended. He has been charged with attempted murder, aggravated assault, assault with a weapon, and two counts of failing to comply with the release order. The victim in this case was transported to hospital in critical condition with multiple stab wounds, and I am incredibly grateful that I can say, thankfully, he has survived. The impact of this violence, the, the impact this violence has on the life of the victim and their loved ones, as well as the witnesses who are on that subway train, and indeed, for all of us in the city, has a lasting effect. These incidents cause fear in the community and compromise our sense of safety in our public spaces. This is yet another example of our need to work with our partners at the federal government on the important topic of strengthening bail reform, a topic this board has joined me in advocating on. The accused in this case has an extensive criminal history and in fact was scheduled to appear in court on the day this senseless act of violence took place. He failed to show up at court and a bench warrant was issued for his arrest. The accused has consistently showed disregard for his court-ordered releases and, is, and has proven an inability to refrain from engaging in antisocial and violent behaviors. Repeat violent offenders with extensive criminal records should not be given the opportunity to return to our streets where they perpetually compromise the safety and well-being of our communities. The command and I are resolute and committed to continue working with key government stakeholders to reform the current bail and parole policies to address this growing safety concern. And lastly, Chair, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Duby Kenan Gisser. <clears throat> On behalf of the entire command team, I want to acknowledge and congratulate Dr. Duby Kenan Gisser for being selected as the Executive Director of the Toronto Police Service Board. I've had the honor of working with Dr. Kenan Gesser for the, over the past few years, and I have no doubt that under his leadership, the small but mighty team of board staff will be well served with him as the executive director. I'm confident that his academic accomplishments, extensive experience in policy development and evaluation, as well as understanding of the needs of our communities and our members, will serve him well in his new role. We look forward to continuing to work with Doobie Kenning Gesser in his new role. Doobie, congratulations. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. <coughs> Perhaps we can um, go back to the beginning of the agenda. The very first item is a confirmation of the minutes from the regular public meeting held on June 22nd, 2023, and I believe we have uh, a number of deputations. Um, <coughs> first, uh, Derek, I believe uh, you both, uh, thank you for your written submission and you also wish to speak. <laughs> so in these minutes, it says, Following a deputation from Mr. Langenfeld, Chair Morgan advised that based on her experience as a provincial appointee, board appointments undergo a vigorous screening process to determine if there are any potential conflicts of interest. Now, I know, Chair Morgan, that it's over a 1,500-page book, but Donovan Waters, in his Law of Trusts in Canada text, surprisingly, said uh, that the first duty of a trustee is to make sure that the process of which they were chosen to be a trustee was done properly. So I just want to point out that in order in Council 685-2023 says, on the recommendation of the undersigned, the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario by and with the advice and concurrence of the Executive Council of Ontario orders that pursuant to Section 27 of the Police Services Act as amended, Nicola, is it? Uh, Nick uh, Migliori of Toronto, be appointed as a member of the City of Toronto Police Services Board to serve at the pleasure of the Lieutenant Governor and Council for a period not to exceed one year effective from the date this order and Council is made. Now it mentions the word undersign, which is the, uh, defined in Black's Law Dictionary as a person whose name is signed at the end of a document. So it implies that this was order and Council was supposed to be signed by the Lieutenant Governor Elizabeth Dowdswell, but I mean, 
nobody can probably see it, but if you go to check this actual order in council, it's actually hasn't been signed by the lieutenant governor. So, I mean, I don't, I technically, I think that would say to me that um, he's not actually officially a member of this board yet, and this board still only has six members. Um, when I went onto the province's website for police services boards, it says appointees to police services boards should be active members of the community with a general knowledge of police services boards, duties and responsibilities, and awareness of community safety issues and programs within their local community. Members appointed by the province of Ontario must be residents of Ontario and cannot be a judge, justice of the peace, a current police officer, or a person who practices criminal law as a defense counsel. It just so happens that when he was uh, mentioned that he was named to this board uh, on your Twitter website, Stu Ely, or Ely, a retired inspector with Toronto Police Service, mentioned uh, congratulations, Nick, couldn't have picked a better guy. Now, um, I just want to make sure that this doesn't have anything to do with Nick the man. This, to me, has to do with being... Ainsworth Morgan was a school principal. He was, like, absolutely at arm's length from the Toronto Police. To me, I just have an objection um, to Nick's appointment to this board based solely on, I, I don't think it's in the public interest with how closely he's worked with police over the years. I mean, I would normally say that, yeah, why, why should somebody who works for Toronto Crime Stoppers not be able to serve on the Toronto Police Services Board until I noticed that Toronto Crime Stoppers is located at 40 College Street. And wait a second, I, I'm in 40 College Street right now. So that's a red flag for me. Uh, Chris mentioned that the Executex uh, website uh, for his page, it mentions that current, he's, Nick is current treasurer of the Toronto Police and Private Security Association, TAPS, um, winning the 2008 Chief Shanahan Award from the International Chiefs of Police Association for Excellence in Public and Private Partnership Cooperation. He has received numerous appreciation and award presentations from the RCMP Training Branch, the RCMP Combined Forces Special Enforcement Unit, Ontario Provincial Police, United States Secret Service, NATO Office of Security, International Police Association, Canadian Society of Industrial Security, and many others. Here's the worst one. Nick is one of the few recipients of the Honorary Detective Gold Shield Badge from the Toronto Police Service. Okay, now that, technically that does not make him a police officer, but that's pretty much as close as a civilian can get to being a police officer with what was just said there. Now the problem is, is that if you wanted to look this up for yourself, you can't, because since Chris brought this up last month, it's been deleted off of Executech's webpage. If you go on and punch in his, Nick's page, you get redirected to someone named Kim Carr, who ironically, the page says, was a veteran investigator with the Toronto Police Services. And Chris Langenfeld, in an email to me yesterday, said that, I also noticed when I was at Ford Fest here in Scarborough before the by-election that Executech is the firm Doug Ford paid to provide security at that event. There were dozens of Executech K logoed vehicles and guys in Executech uniforms overseeing the people. Uh, thank you, uh, Derek, uh, and uh, we can always look into uh, the signed order in council for the provincial appointees, which is also someone myself, and just want to comment that if being in this building uh, prohibited somebody from uh, being an active member of the sport, I spent probably the better part of 30 years here interviewing witnesses, assisting with search warrants. Uh, I was a wiretap agent, so uh, I'm not sure that that makes somebody uh, biased or a police officer. So thank you for your comments, but I just wanted to add that. Okay, but you probably you. prosecuted a police officer at some point in your career, though. We have another deputation, um, uh, Miguel Avila. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> good morning. Um, I joined on the same controversy uh, that Chris Langenfeld has uh, spoken at the last board meeting, and now today, Derek also providing more information about Nick. 
Um, I just want to go on record that I sent a um, letter to Olivia Chow, the new mayor of the city of Toronto, letting her know that this travesty should not be allowed under her watch. Uh, she has not replied yet, but we know that next month in August she will be some, making some important decisions as to who is going to be filling up those chairs with new board members, I, I will assume. So I just want to go um, and tell you that I feel so sorry about the loss of your, one of your members of your force, uh, Bingo, as an animal lover. I acknowledge that this is um, sad news for you guys. I um, also want to also recognize that something that is not in the minutes, but it was important to go on the record that in 2012, I spoke at this board in relation to the um, so-called officer's bar that you have in this, uh, used to have in this uh, location. So back in 2012, I, make, uh, I spoke on this matter, and no one take it seriously. So it's 2023. And because there's um, an issue that is well known that a superintendent got in, into an accident, now you decide to shut down the bar without further explanations. So that happens between last month board meeting and this board's meeting. So maybe it should be included in the minutes. But that is up to you. Uh, anyway, um, is, um, one of my uh, suggestions is uh, why don't we turn this bar into a coffee shop? Because, you know, one of the things that you don't have in this building is a coffee shop. So many times I have come here sleepless, living in Toronto housing, you know, it's crazy. And I'm, I'm, I'm dying for a cup of coffee. But I don't want to go through the screen door and they tell me I cannot bring a cup of coffee because it's considered to be a weapon. So also, I want to uh, continue by remind uh, this board that we need to have an indigenous representative. Uh, we elected uh, Nick, we elected another board member, um, but we don't have an indigenous presentation. So again, Olivia Chow, if you're watching this uh, YouTube channel video, please re remind you that uh, truth and reconciliation means you know, inclusive of all groups of people, and basically in this board, the absence is very notorious. We don't want to be part of a consultation group where you come to us and say, hey, what do you think about this decision we made last month? Or what are we going to do next year? So why don't we just have the person right here and, and ask us, you know, do we agree with things that you want to pass that will affect our lives? So in conclusion, I want to um, thank uh, Derek for bringing this important information. I want to thank Chris, and I hope this matter gets resolved because Nick, perhaps, it's not about Nick, it's about the process. We want to have the right people that will speak for us. And I don't think someone uh, appointed by the province, we know Doug Ford doesn't like us, the poor, so please select better person. Thank you. Thank you, and, and perhaps since um, I was myself and uh, member Migliori, it's a complaint to make to the province because these are provincial uh, elect, um, appointments. Um, yeah, the city appointments is something I also added to the letter to Olivia Chow to review that directorate because uh, that is the problem that we have right here. Where is the, where is the indigenous guy in the room? Is here? That is the biggest question I always ask. No answer. Okay. That's Thank you. I'll just want to note that I do have the uh, order in council here, a copy of it, and it is signed. So, and I've Can you showed it. To me? Sure, All right. no <laughs> problem. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and at um, this point, uh, can I have a, a motion to approve the minutes of the June 22nd, 2023? <laughs> Member Kostak is seconded by <laughs> Member Migliori. All in favor? Thank you, seeing no opposed. Um, and now we move to item number two, um, and that is uh, there's a presentation as it relates to executing search warrants. There's a procedural update. Is that a speaker on that? Is there? Or just takes that All right, the report. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I wasn't sure if anybody was going to actually presentation. We have received a, a thorough report as it relates to this. And we also uh, thank Mr. John Sewell and Mr. Jack Gimmel because they both provided uh, written submissions as it related to uh, these updated procedures. And there is a presentation. Oh, there is. Okay. <laughs> there is.
Thank you, Chair Mor <clears throat> Morgan. Um, this morning, I'd like to uh, introduce Inspector Stefan Prentiss, who's, who uh, is the second in command of our intelligence unit. Um, while he was a member of the chief staff, and uh, along with, um, um, I'm not sure if, if uh, James Cornish is on the line, but uh, the, the two of them, with an the entire team behind them, um, you know, you know, were able to. Um, um, do a review, sorry, of our existing uh, search warrant um, procedure, and today you're going to hear the details of uh, how we got to where we are today, uh, what the implementation committee was, uh, how they were formed, um, and and the um, uh, the recommendations from the OIPRD uh, that, uh, that that meeting uh, in the chief's opening remarks. Uh, we introduced the fact that we had updated our uh, executing search warrant procedure, and there was a significant. Uh, uh, interest in that by the board so we're here today to provide you a bit more detail on uh, how we've updated our governance in relation to executing search warrants uh, with that I'm going to turn it over to James Cornish to uh, talk a little bit about uh, how we uh, ended up uh, starting this review opportunity to speak at a board meeting since you're uh, taking the uh, the chair's position. Uh, it's funny how uh, long-term prosecutors cross paths later in life. Um, as, as Stefan has mentioned, uh, this uh, procedure was updated uh, just recently and <clears throat> it generated a fair bit of uh, interest at the board meeting, I think it was two meetings ago, so we, the chief thought that we should uh, uh, pay a bit more time, spend a bit more time explaining uh, the significance of this change. We received in November of last year, uh, while Chief Raymer was still in the chair, a letter of uh, notification from the uh, director of the OIPRD, Mr. Leach. Uh, Mr. Leach uh, when he uh, assumed the role as director, created a, a halfway point uh, so he didn't have to go into a systemic review uh, unless it was absolutely necessary. He uh, issued a notification to <clears throat> uh, various police agencies in Ontario asking them to review their search warrant uh, procedures, especially as it relates to uh, unannounced entry or no knocks. Um, we, uh, we cooperated and uh, partnered, actually, with the OIPRD, and uh, the result was, uh, I believe, success, and I think that's borne out by the letter that the uh, director sent to us that uh, we have shared with the board and the public. The, uh, the, the concerns uh, were that our, I think the main concern, was that our procedure and governance had not kept pace with the changes in the law. As you will be aware, uh, Chair Morgan, uh, this search is an active area of litigation in our criminal courts, and uh, the law changes uh, sometimes subtly, sometimes drastically, uh, without much notice. Uh, what we found was, and uh, Inspector Prentice will uh, get into this a bit more, but generally what we found was uh, we were in compliance with the law in our practice, but our procedures did not reflect our practice. So if we go to the areas of concern, um, those were apparent areas of concern when you looked at our procedure, uh, but when we reviewed our practices, we, uh, we found that what we needed to do was uh, amend our procedure to reflect not only our practices, but uh, the current state of the law. So we, uh, one of the other areas that wasn't particularly uh, uh, highlighted by the OIPRD, but comes out in the uh, two deputations that you received in writing, was our failure to be able to track numbers on, uh, on these uh, no-knock uh, warrants. Uh, this procedure rectifies that. And so I believe that we have uh, uh, created a procedure that will uh, be a, uh, a template for other services as they, uh, they, they uh, 
advance their own procedures on this area of the law. And with that, I'll just I'll turn it back over to uh, to Stephen. Thank you, James, and thanks for your good wishes. Thank you very much, James. Um, so as a result of the notification uh, by the OIPRD, the chief, uh, then Chief Raymer, uh, struck a working group. Uh, part of that working group uh, included uh, Inspector Leahy from the Emergency Task Force, uh, Superintendent Steve Watts, uh, who is the unit commander of the or our Organized Crime Enforcement Unit, and within the Office of the Chief, uh, Mr. James Cornish, uh, the Chief's Executive Officer at the time, Superintendent Don Belanger, myself, and in our governance, Ms. Shauna Bent, who's an expert in governance, as well as uh, legal services, Mr. Noah Schachter. But we also took an opportunity in parts of this uh, procedure to also consult with the Ministry of the Attorney General. So you'll see that there was uh, internally a very uh, di diverse group of people that uh, brought, leveraged their expertise and their knowledge in this area to uh, affect some of these changes. Uh, one, one thing that happened at the, once the procedure had been uh, sort of in its finalized draft from the review was it was passed through our GERC committee, which is the Governance Equity Review Committee, which was led by Ms. Uh, Laura Flyer and, uh, and Superintendent Andrew Eklund. And the purpose of doing that was to add a, an equity uh, lens, a human rights lens to the procedure to make sure that uh, that was taken into account before the procedure was actually finalized. And I can tell you as a result of each of the engagements we had with our stakeholders and with the uh, GERC committee, there were changes that were uh, adopted uh, and added into the uh, procedure, including with the OIPRD themselves. They uh, provided suggestions and there was a back and forth conversation as we designed this uh, procedure that were in fact incorporated. And as James has already said, that the review really uncovered the fact that our practices uh, by and large, have kept up with uh, governance, uh, uh, kept up with law and current best practice. But part of what the OIPRD had raised in their uh, in their notification was communication to the public. So by not having by not having that proceduralized, essentially we were keeping the public in the dark about what we were actually doing. So by updating this procedure and posting it publicly, we're fulfilling one of those commitments to to demonstrate to the public and communicate to the public exactly what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, the governance also really respects the, the fact that uh, executing search warrants and these types of investigations are extremely dynamic. There are a multitude of inputs that happen uh, before a search warrant ex is executed, during the planning phases, uh, right, right up until the point where uh, you knock on the door or you do a dynamic entry. Uh, and sometimes the initial plans that you make information changes and then you have to uh, adapt to that information and change your plan. So governance uh, sets the stage for what the expectation is in the first instance, but also allows, but allows uh, our members to make decisions in the moment that are, are best for the situation that they're facing at hand. Uh, but what goes along with that is always the need to articulate, document, and be prepared to testify and justify your actions. That, that component is built into every aspect of this procedure in uh, this procedure. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that what we were doing in our procedure was also aligned with what our current training was. So the Toronto Police College was also consulted as part of this process to ensure that what we were in fact putting into governance did reflect the training that occurs at the college. And so uh, this procedure was fairly unique in that we've added an appendix that actually lists two of the, uh, two of the courses at the college that actually have the material that's in this search warrant procedure uh, taught on their courses. So in terms of data and documentation, uh, as, as James has, has flagged, we really had a struggle to uh, document how many times we were executing search warrants without giving a prior announcement. And so what we've done is uh, removed one of our occurrences in our RMS system and replaced it with two other occurrences uh, so that we can delineate immediately whether or not it was an announced entry or an unannounced entry, and we can run that data to, uh, to determine how, how often and how many times we're doing this. Uh, what we noticed with the emergency task force is uh, they've, they've, uh, they've updated their procedures internally around search warrant executed and operational planning, risk assessments. They're, they were much farther ahead. And so a lot of what we've done is premised on work that they've already done. So they've been collecting this kind of data for a number of years now. So uh, we can provide data on uh, around the emergency task force, but just service-wide, we're not able to provide that data, but we will be able to provide that going forward uh, because of some of these changes. 
Uh, one of the things that we've added into the procedure is an assessment of risk factors and entry plan template, text template. And what that will do is allow us to capture uh, information around what were the considerations uh, that were, were taken into account as we were planning our search warrant, things that we knew that we had to account for. So things like, are there people, uh, uh, how many people are in the, the, the residence? Uh, what, what's the floor plan layout? Do we expect uh, weapons? Is there a history of violence with anybody we know we expect to be in the premise? Are there vulnerable people? Are there people with uh, mental health conditions that we need to take uh, into consideration? So all of that is, is baked into the assessment that goes into the information we, we look at beforehand. And the, the uh, supervisors that, and the case managers that are in charge of that search warrant are obligated to document that information and document as much of that information they know beforehand uh, uh, before the search warrant is uh, actually executed. Um, also, as part of the, uh, the data collection is the, the formation of briefing packages. It's something that we've been doing for a very, very long time is creating briefing packages for members that are executing a search warrant. But again, we didn't make that visible by putting it into our procedure. So something, again, that we've always done by, by practice has now been proceduralized and the requirement to have briefing packages. So those, I think those three things in terms of data and documentation will really go a long way, uh, especially with the assessment of risk factors uh, text template. There's also a requirement to document any alternatives you can, you've considered. And again, that's something that we've been doing for a long time, often in court, uh, where I've given testimony on, on executing a search warrant. I've always been asked the question, well, you did it this way, but what other ways did you think about doing it? And that is something that is, again, sort of baked into how we do what we do, but again, wasn't visible. So now we're really making that visible and, and, and shining a light for it, uh, on it for our membership. So in terms of communication with the public, uh, I think part of the co-design of this uh, particular procedure was that back and forth conversation with the OIPRD as, a, as one of our oversight agencies uh, in terms of how we built this particular procedure. As well, one of the things they've highlighted is just the need to communicate to people in the moment. Like after we've executed a search warrant and you have people that are in the residence, how are we communicating to those people what we did and why we did it? So often, we've always had to leave a copy of the search warrant that explained you know, the authority that we were there. But we've also added a new TPS form that officers that are on scene can fill out, and it provides information to the owner-occupant of that particular residence about what kind of search warrant was done at your premise, if we, did, if we entered or we didn't enter uh, with an announcement, whether that happened and some of the reasons and the reason why we did that. And I'll get into that justification in, in just a little bit. Uh, but also if there's damage, uh, who the supervisor was that was at the scene that they can contact. Uh, to follow up because we do have obligations to engage in aftercare uh, if there were uh, people injured or if uh, we did cause damage. Uh, and, then, uh, and, and then finally, in, in relation to communication with the public, this, post, this procedure was posted publicly as part of our commitment under Board Direction 36 to post our procedures publicly. So that was, that was done uh, at the same time that the, the order was published uh, in June of this year. So I'll just give you a couple of quick highlights as to what you might see in the procedure. It's a fairly lengthy procedure, and there's been a lot of updates, but I'll just pull out some of the highlights just to, so the board understands. In this section, what you'll see here, the important bit is that a supervisor uh, or a detective, which is a supervisor in a plainclothes capacity, uh, is actually present physically at the search warrant. For every search warrant that we do, that's a requirement that they are there. Again, something that has always happened in practice, but is now uh, uh, proceduralized. Uh, and as well, though, there, is a, uh, there are unforeseen circumstances. We may be setting up to do search warrants at a, perhaps a number of residences, and sometimes we're forced to execute that search warrant before we're ready because of circumstances. It happens. So the supervisor may not be present when the search warrant is actually executed. So this allows members that are there to execute those search warrants, but they, they, they must immediately notify a supervisor and provide them some reasons and then justify and document the reason why they, they took the action that they did so that we can have an understanding and make sure that we're holding ourselves accountable to uh, our processes. In this particular section, uh, what you're going to see is that the ETF when they're, when they're contacted under specific reasons, that they are in charge of the search warrant. They are the ones that are, will uh, conduct their assessment of risk factors and make a determination as to how the entry will proceed, and, and their sergeant will be, uh, their supervisor will be in charge of that search warrant. Um, what you'll also see here specifically is that 
uh, the, the supervisor or the ETF supervisor at the search warrant has to communicate with the, with the case manager and because the case manager of the case is the one that has the most information about what is happening in that particular investigation. So it, so it ensures that the person that's making the decision on how the warrant is going to be executed has all the information that they need. So that communication between the person who has that knowledge is, is firmly entrenched in our procedures. Again, something that always happened by, by, by practice, but just not written down and made visible. Uh, in this particular area of governance, what you'll see is that a prior announcement to executing a search warrant is the standard. That's the, base, that's the base. We are obligated to provide an announcement before we enter a premise on a search warrant. A dynamic entry or a no-knock entry is a deviation from that standard. So it's important to, rec to recognize that uh, when, we when we deviate, that it is a deviation and we need grounds to deviate from that. And you'll see here that this, uh, the second paragraph where we talk about reasonable grounds to be concerned about the destruction of evidence or reasonable grounds to be concerned about the possibility of harm to themselves or occupants, that amounts to suspicion that weapons or presence or violence will be used following the, an announced entry. That comes directly out of, out of case law, uh, Regina versus Cornell back in 2010 of the Supreme Court. So we've taken the language directly from that case law and put it into our procedure so that everybody knows uh, this is uh, under the circumstances under which we can execute a search warrant without providing a prior announcement. Uh, here you'll also see where we've uh, t t uh, mem uh, memorialized the assessment of risk factors and entry plans that need to be completed uh, when we execute a search warrant, but also the fact that this document should be completed to the extent possible in advance of the search warrant. And what that does is it, in it inoculates our officers and our investigators against the accusation of post facto uh, justification, which is something that you would have seen in the uh, deputation provided by the Law Union of Ontario. Uh, and again, that's something that is, is uh, by practice, we, we inoculate ourselves to all the time because that is something that in court we're constantly testifying to is when we made our notes, how we made our notes, what we were doing when we made our notes and justifying decisions so that we're able to defend against uh, taking, people accusing us of taking action and then just coming up with reasons to justify it afterwards. So it allows us to do that. Uh, in this particular slide, what you'll see is um, uh, just... The, the requirements on a supervisory officer and what they're responsible for and making sure that those reports and assessments are completed. Uh, as well, uh, one major uh, form that, uh, change that we made here is that when we've executed a search warrant at an incorrect address where we've done something wrong, uh, th this is the first trigger that triggers a, a line of communication that goes directly into command mm -hmm. so that if we've, if we've executed at a wrong address or we've arrested a wrong person under, um, uh, under a mistake, that we can take action immediately right at the highest levels of our organization and engage uh, in, uh, in, a, in a process to, uh, to mitigate uh, any, any further damage to the, to the people that have been impacted by this. Uh, and then you'll see uh, as well that we've uh, memorialized as well where there's money or other valuables that we're engaging supervisors as part of the process of itemizing and, and uh, uh, counting that, that, that type of... Uh, uh, material. Uh, and then just following on, we're almost through the, the uh, updates here, is that the staff or detective sergeant, uh, we've, we've placed the onus on them of every search warrant that's been executed, that they are to review all the documents that were, are submitted in relation to that search warrant, which include the assessment of risk factors and entry plan, as well as the alternatives that were considered. And that's so that we can ensure that there's some oversight uh, uh, placed on members that are executing these search warrants, and then the, the uh, detective sergeants can take any necessary action they need uh, to make sure that members are complying with procedure. Uh, again, this is also the second step in terms of notification when we've uh, executed a search warrant at an incorrect address. You'll see very quickly it moves right up to the unit commander in the next uh, area there, where the unit commander is also responsible for, for notifying their staff superintendent if we've executed at an incorrect address. But specifically, the unit commander, if that happens, they have to engage in an investigation and document why that happened so that we, we can ensure that that doesn't happen again. So once, the, uh, once this procedure was actually rolled out and a routine order was issued that uh, uh, published 
so, so that all members could see the updates to this particular procedure. But uh, on top of that, there were presentations to command the senior management team and all unit commanders to highlight these changes. So they all went through training. So they understood what the, what the changes were, as well as every detective sergeant in the service received uh, training uh, by me over a period of uh, over a period of a few weeks where I walked them through all these changes and the, all the new requirements so they could then uh, take that information and translate it down to their teams, but also understand what their responsibilities were uh, as it relates to these, uh, these updates to, uh, to procedure. And just one, la uh, one last thing I'll, I'll finish on is that um, the work doesn't finish there because now we've launched this procedure. There's, a, there's a, an opportunity where I'll now follow up with these detective sergeants, these units, to see that the, the procedure is actually being followed and how, how it's been adopted by, by these units. So subject to any questions or any additions by uh, James? I think the, the, the last thing I'd like to point out is that uh, we have now rectified one of the significant issues, which is our inability to track. And so we can now measure uh, uh, the use of no knocks and uh, command will be able to manage it. That, uh, so there, and there should be assurance to the board that, that because we consulted with the Ministry of the Attorney General search unit at the Crown Law Office Criminal, this procedure reflects the current state of the law in respect of searches of places. So before the chief maybe makes comments, I just want to again highlight how, uh, uh, you know, this was a great example of, um, you know, uh, teamwork and thoughtful legal and operational analysis. And also, as James had mentioned at the end there, that, um, you know, this procedure was crafted to ensure that we have, you know, complete compliance with the current law and best practices as we know today. And, and there were substantial favorable comments from, uh, from mm -hmm. the OAPRD. Thank you. I just had one question um, uh, along, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, I, I enjoyed it, uh, reading it. I, I was just wondering, uh, are these particular um, procedures that have been codified, is there any overlay with um, the, the uh, um, if and when body-worn cameras are turned on during these searches, and B, whether or not uh, there's some searches that may or may not be videotaped. So mm -hmm. I was just wondering about the interplay of, of that. Yeah, I'll, let, I'll let the deputy. Uh... So chair, um, you'll know in the uh, one of the written submissions that that issue is brought up and um, uh, our ETF members now are equipped with body worn cameras as well as all our front line. There is a specific uh, procedure that uh, outlines the responsibilities with respect to body worn cameras. So those things are now embedded in the process. Thank you. Um, Councillor Chang, you had a question. Thank you, uh, and it's great that you're, you know, matching procedure with practice. Uh, just a few questions. So there's a, um, this is quite a comprehensive update and in, a, in the middle of a decision to make a no-knock warrant, it's, it's probably quite a stressful, intense moment. It's not like they're, you know, everyone's at a computer having a meeting. You're in a moment and it's a very intense decision-making moment and I'm just wondering, um, you know, what is the process of go training the officers, but then helping them to internalize uh, all of these procedures so that in a critical moment they are able to recall all of these pieces uh, to ensure that we are able to create and capture the data we're hoping to, to get? So, th thank you for the question. Um, I think that. Uh, what you're referring to it, it really speaks to why we have supervisors that are at search warrants and they are in charge of those search warrants. Um, supervisors will have gone through extensive training at the police college on a number of uh, supervisory courses, but also uh, the, you know, plainclothes courses, search warrant drafting courses. So we have these courses that teach them these skills 
from a training perspective, but the supervisor also ha that also has the benefit of experience. So the supervisors will have been involved in a number of search warrants. They may have worked in units, high-risk units, before even becoming a supervisor. So we're really baking in that experience and that training uh, into those moments so that when they're uh, involved in those situations that are dynamic and they have to make decisions, uh, they're able to uh, dip into the, their experience and make those decisions in a thoughtful way. And Councillor, if I might add also, uh, what, what you said earlier about the fact that nobody sitting at a computer sort of uh, discussing this before, they actually do. Uh, and while it might look like from the outside uh, lens that this is a bit of chaos, uh, you know, these, these officers have had briefings before, they have a plan of action, there are contingencies uh, in place for uh, potential risks uh, and, and, you know, the, um, uh, the execution of the search warrant is, is, is um, uh, you know, done as, in as safe as way uh, as possible, not only for the members involved but for the, uh, for the individuals, uh, members of the community that, uh, that might be affected by this. That's, um, I wonder if I could just add something just, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but generally speaking, some of these no-knock entries are, are not routine, and they're also usually performed in large or more complicated uh, investigations. Therefore, you have highly skilled various uh, trained teams. So, for example, at Gun and Games or ETF, some of the ones you've, you've been hearing about. So not only do these folks have the initial training at the college and through their roles as they progress through the ranks, and then they have the oversight. So um, it's not, generally speaking, uh, a young officer who's two years on the job who's actually, the, you know, the one who's actually involved they may be part of the plan in that they're assisting with the plan but likely not the person who's the orchestrating of the plan and it's, it's helpful to know that the no knock warrant is not a decision that's made in front of the door it's made in a meeting so i think that's very help illuminating for those of us who are still fairly new um there is somewhere here where uh in the report that says that when uh a scene, when you're leaving a scene to secure the scene, that it should be left with a competent person. And I'm just wondering, is there a definition of what a competent person is? Just to, um, because that seems like a very, you know, open to interpretation term uh, and maybe needs a little unpacking. Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know that we've defined uh, a competent person in our governance. I'd have to have a have a look. But as a practitioner, uh, having executed a number of search warrants uh, and you know discussed with my colleagues, you know, a competent person for us would really be somebody who has some authority at the residence, but is also capable of managing what comes next. So a competent person would not be a 12-year-old. A competent person would not be somebody who has diminished capacity or somebody who has no color of right in the property, uh, but a property manager would. So things like, so we, we, would con we would use our best judgment to consider who's the best person to leave in charge of this residence that would be able to secure it and also make sure that you know, anybody inside that you know, needed looking after could be looked after, but also that wouldn't steal everything mm -hmm. uh, inside the place when we, when we, when we left might be helpful to clarify that in the procedures just so that there's clarity and not um, you know risk of misinterpretation with regard to uh, body worn cameras TPS 15-20 I'm sorry I wasn't really clear on the answer to chair Morgan's question so is there an explicit requirement that body worn cameras are used when a, a search warrant is being executed. Is that part of, because I don't know what that policy is, and I'm just wondering, is, are all search warrants videotaped on body-worn cameras? Or is that subject to a choice, a moment? There, there's a very narrow um, um, criteria where it would be, but generally, uh, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, every member, uniform member, as well as uh, members of the ETF who do these, these type of entries have body-worn cameras. Yeah, uh, Councillor, uh, if I might, uh, I worked with uh, Dr. Kenna Gisser uh, to create our procedure on body-worn camera to match the policy of the board on body-worn cameras. And there are very few circumstances where the body-worn camera 
can be turned off. So uh, if uh, an officer has a body worn camera on, on a, on a warrant search uh, where there's legal authority to enter, that camera should be turned on. Uh, if it's not, they've been, they're in breach of the procedure. And are the body worn cameras kept on during the um, capturing of evidence? So if you're counting money or counting whatever it is that's there, is the body worn camera also used? Because it says uh, in the policy that you have to have a supervisor there, and, and that's good practice, but a body worn camera would add a layer of documentation. So we do in the procedure require a uniform officer to be present at all search warrants. So uh, that body worn camera comes with the uniform officer. So is it on during the evidence? Uh, I don't know what you, the term for it, but when you're capturing what the evidence yeah. is. The, the, the body worn camera should be on throughout. It should only be turned off or blocked uh, to uh, uh, protect against embarrassment of people who are you know, in a state of undress or otherwise you know, debilitated. Uh, so the answer to your question is, yeah, it should be on. It's not designed to create a video record, but it will. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll just add to that as well. Within the procedure, there is a requirement that when uh, items of significance of evidence are found, that the, the owner-occupant actually is, is brought to, to see that seizure, but also that it's itemized uh, there as well, and it's photographed and videotaped. Okay, because I believe there was a previous case where the money that was photographed and then the money that was counted for, it didn't match. And so was there a body-worn camera in that situation that videotaped the counting of the money at the, the crime scene? So that, uh, the answer is no, that predated the, uh, the body-worn camera policy and procedure. But just to clarify, um, you know, as, as Stefan mentioned, the procedure 1520 in there, it specifically says that the officer is to uh, uh, have the camera on to record any other interaction where the officer believes that a body-worn camera recording would support them in the execution of their duty. So they're, they're, they're performing a specific duty when they're seizing evidence. So that would be captured. There'd be no reason to turn it off. And we have two other proper uh, procedures that sort of deal with um, valuables and the collection of, of money, for instance. It's uh, procedure 218, which is uh, the, the one we're talking here. 1520 is the body-worn camera. And then in, uh, 901, which specifically talks about uh, how an officer will collect and account for property. So it is all, uh, all dealt with in, in those three procedures. So moving forward, we are going to videotape evidence seizures and out, uh, accounting. So it's, uh, it's not videotaped. The, the body-worn camera is a little bit different from a videotape, oh, okay, same right. concept. But you, you should know that also when we have uh, you know, crime scene specialists or forensic folks that show up to, to some of these events, there are video uh, recordings that are taken before and after um, you know, specific um, um, uh, duties are performed. I still come from the VHS beta <laughs> generation. I'm <just> updating <laughs> myself. Um, okay, so the other piece that I, you know, wanted to, I, I, I'm grateful for the piece about, you know, when people are perhaps wearing their nightgowns, that you know, there is a a, a whole piece about how we should um, approach that. And I, I wonder if there was any consideration of impact on children during search warrants, because I know, um, you know, in previously working with um, youth from under-resourced communities, um, some have shared how traumatic it was when they were young and to have an older sibling or a family member, um, you know, have a search warrant, uh, have police enter the home in a very, um, in a way that actually I think left some trauma for, for these young people. So I'm wondering if that is a consideration and if not, is it, would it be a future consideration in terms of procedures, how children are, um, you know, how we acknowledge the impact and care for them in such a difficult moment? So um, I, I agree with what you're talking about, having executed a number of search warrants where children were, were present. Uh, I've seen firsthand the impact it has even in those moments, uh, and not just of the people at the actual search warrant. I've been involved in search warrants where children were in vehicles that just sort of happened to get trapped in the area, 
and seeing the impact on them not even being involved. Uh, so I, I completely agree with what you're what you're talking about. Uh, depending on the nature of the uh, the search warrant itself, uh, often there would be a trigger to children's aid uh, because of children being present uh, where there's criminal activity. Not necessarily in every case, but I think in, in a lot of cases that would happen. Uh, I think there is an opportunity potentially in training and, and some follow-up uh, areas where we could put a focus on impact uh, to children, and, and we can certainly uh, look at doing that. I don't know necessarily that proceduralizing it is the, the right way to go in, specifically in, as it relates to children. Um, we do actually in our training uh, have uh, high-risk vehicle takedowns as part of our plainclothes course. And one of those scenarios actually is around a child in a vehicle. And the, the learning objective is to call off the takedown and not do it because, the, because of the presence of the child. So these are things that are, are baked into uh, our training and, and what we uh, consider as we do this. But certainly the aftercare portion is something we could look at. Because um, I'm just thinking like this form that you leave with the premises uh, after a, a warrant, maybe, you know, is there a piece where it's, it's hard because the, the family members are not victims, but the only um, department in, in the police force that can provide aftercare would be victim services. So, you know, what kind of resources and support could be provided in that sheet? Like, if this was upsetting to you, especially if you have children, here is someone who can help you, and, and who would that be? Um, maybe that's worth something to unpack. You know, we could put something even just pre-printed on the back of the, that form that mm -hmm. says if children are present or you need support, here are some areas mm -hmm. in contact. Yep, that's certainly something I'll, I'll take back. And I, you know, I noticed that you know, in the, in the um, committee, there was representatives from the equity and diversity um, group. And, but I'm wondering um, why the anti-racism advisory was not part of this. Would that not add also an important lens to this uh, procedural update? I'll let, uh... I'm happy to maybe add. So the, so the, um, the kind of the original um, committee that was struck with the Equity, Inclusion, and Human Rights Unit, they did take an anti-racism lens as well. They actually collaborated with the city's anti-racism group. Um, their anti-black racism group specifically around CABER and so that's built in to the overall framework that they use in the committee on how they evaluate each of the procedures. I think it would be helpful even you know as a follow-up to still have a warp through with the with ARAP just because um, the raison d'etre of the group is to provide that lens from within the organization. Um, and I am also wondering, so in the city of Toronto, often when we have new policies or things, there's always the paragraph about the impact uh, the, th on diversity and inclusion. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, I, I see that they, there was this lens, but I, there's no actual summary of here are the things that we considered, here's the potential impacts from a equity and, and a, a inclusion lens in terms of this governance update. So in terms of like an impact statement, uh, I've not seen that in our governance in any procedure. So I think, I think, uh, I think uh, Councillor, if I'm understanding you correctly, this is a broader discussion around how we do policy as a board and procedure as a service operationalizing the policy of the board and what we might note in our considerations at the conclusion of our individual roles. So not specific necessarily to just this procedure. Mm -hmm. right? So I, I think perhaps that's a takeaway, Chair, if I may commit to that, uh, to work with uh, board staff on how we might put that to life as it relates to policy development and procedure when it's operationalizing policy. That would be very helpful, thank you. And yes, thank you for this report. I think it's a very sensitive issue that is important um, and I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Crisanti, I think you had a question or a comment. Um, I do, I just have a question. Thank you, Chair. So I just wanted some clarity over, uh, you know, uh, between the um, search warrant procedures that you've been describing, I think mostly do, that 
could happen or do happen during the course of an investigation that leads up to a search warrant uh, versus an active situation uh, uh, on the street and where there is uh, maybe a, a, a suspect that, uh, uh, or you suspect there's a suspect in, in, in a residence or on a property. And, and uh, what do you do at that point when you know that you need to enter a property and it's happening right at that moment? So, uh, yeah, what you're talking about is uh, an engagement that occurs on the street and a person flees and goes into a residence and we want to arrest that person, is that? Correct, and, and okay. you m may be certain he's in a residence or may not be certain that he or someone, if someone is in that residence. Certainly. There could be uncertainty over that. So Certainly. But uh, for the safety of the community, there is, uh, there, again, this is an active situation and it's happening right there and then. What are the procedures surrounding that? So, so what you're, so that situation is governed by uh, arrest, but it's also uh, in the criminal code around. A, uh, you might have heard of Feeney warrants or okay. arrest warrants. Uh, in the case of something dynamic happening in the street, we do have authorities to enter uh, a residence, a dwelling on fresh pursuit. So we have something's happened. We have eyes on the person. We've watched them. We can continue. Uh, doing that as long as it's safe to do so to arrest that person if, if, if it's where we've lost sight of somebody But we know they've entered a residence then there's then there's other rules that that come into place and we're uh, Obligated to seek arrest warrants and you'll see in the top of this procedure uh, that we that we've just introduced to you There's a, actually a section on uh, Feeney warrants, which is falls right. into that category, but we have an entire procedure on arrest where this is also uh, discussed in that particular procedure. So if they've entered a residence and there's, uh, uh, you know, an innocent family in that residence and children and, and whomever now, so you, 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 you stand down at that point and you uh, no. assess and, and proceed after? Not necessarily. Uh, it, it, it's such, it's very specific scenario driven. Uh, it would be sure. difficult to say in broad strokes. Depends on a lot of factors. Yeah, I'm sure. yeah there's yeah, a lot. Uh, maybe I can, I Go can ahead, jump James. in. Oh. Uh, in my experience, uh, as a Crown and, and Chair Morgan can uh, probably weigh in on this, uh, there's a whole continuum of uh, behavior that will attract different legal requirements. So hot pursuit, if, if, if an officer is chasing a suspect into a home and they close the door, the officer is allowed to open that door by force and arrest. Okay. The, if there are exigent circumstances, reasonable grounds to believe that the safety of an occupant is at, at risk, then the officer can enter without warrant. But as, as Stefan mentioned, like if you lose track of them but you have reason to believe they're inside a residence, the law requires that a, a warrant be uh, sought and obtained prior to the entry, and that's commonly called a Feeney warrant. Right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, 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 Member Spencer, you had a, a comment or a question? Yeah, just a question. Um, thank you very much for the report and the presentation. I, I do have a few questions. One, um, you talked about um, when it's incorrect, you've gone to a, a wrong address. What, what happens, what percentage um, of these encounters are, are not the, the right address and so forth. And what happens after? So there's trauma that might have happened um, with the entry and so forth. And how do you address that after? Not just the trauma to the individuals, but maybe collateral damage on the property? Um, so I can say that uh, I, I don't have any data at my fingertips, but in my experience in being here for 27 years, it's rare. It's rare that we would uh, execute a search warrant at an incorrect address, but it does happen. Uh, in terms of the, the responsibility for damage, uh, there is a claim process that we engage in with uh, people where we've damaged property and, and we can reimburse them for the cost or uh, look after those repairs for on behalf of that person. Uh, there, I mean, I think that they, depending on what the impact has been to the person will determine, I think, what the response is. Uh, for some people, it may have just been an inconvenience. If there was no damage, we knocked on their door, said we had a search warrant, and we walked in and we had a conversation. The impact on that would be significantly different than if we had done a dynamic, dynamic entry and put people in handcuffs and put them on the floor and searched them and then found out it was the wrong address. So uh, I think, it, again, to use James's words of a continuum, I think the response there is a continuum, but allowing command right up to Chief Demcu to uh, insert 
uh, direction into that process is what's important. So uh, we have had occasions where we've been able to do that uh, in terms of uh, where we've arrested somebody and it was the wrong person and their, say their car was, was towed and put into the pound. We were able to get that car released for them fairly quickly so that they weren't incurring charges and that was on their, you know, their personal uh, finances, an uh, effect on their personal finances, but then also start to engage the healing process in having meetings uh, and getting the family supports in other ways uh, outside of financial support and, and really just the opportunity to apologize and, and talk to people about the impact we've had and, and work, work to heal that relationship. And uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the board has been uh, briefed previously on similar incidents where, we've, where, where that's actually happened and, and it was a very positive outcome when we've been able to uh, get, uh, get, with the, get to the families, get to the impacted people as quickly as possible to start that healing process uh, with them and, and it, that has a great impact. So the intention here is to allow that to happen very quickly so that the chief doesn't find out two weeks ago something really bad happened and not had the opportunity to, to intercede in that situation. Okay, thank you. And I mean, a lot of the points has, has been addressed already, but I do also want to point out that, you know, ARAP, that point of view would have been, it would have been great to sort of hear what that point of view would have been in this instance, in this process. Thank you. Chief, I think you uh, said you wanted to speak. I, I would. At first, I, I got to acknowledge the uh, work of certainly uh, Inspector Prentice and Mr. Cornish here. Um, but there is, a, there is a team behind the scenes here that brought this forward. Uh, as we obviously witnessed with the dialogue here, this is an important issue, an issue of public uh, interest, uh, et cetera. And it's, we, you know, we definitely want to... I want to take a moment and acknowledge the leadership that was provided by the team that's here today and the team behind the scenes. Uh, but there's also an important, be, um, you know, things we talked about here that are not necessarily about the, the warrants, but an important thing that I want to just highlight for the board and perhaps we'll return at a future meeting uh, to discuss the importance of the Governance uh, Equity Review Committee. Uh, it's an incredible uh, step forward for us to have an equity lens placed on all our procedures. And as much as there may be opportunities uh, for us collectively as a service and board to do some additional annotations on how we come to decisions, but to have a governance equity review committee in policing to review all our procedures, particularly in the scope and scale of the procedural framework that Toronto Police work under is an amazing step forward. And I wanted to take a moment and just make sure I publicly acknowledge that. And it is, it is a committee that sits within our governance framework, co-chaired by members of the Equity, Inclusion and Human Rights Unit, Senior Advisor Laura Flyer, and Inclusion uh, Lead, uh, Grace Ryu, uh, who are doing incredible work, uh, quite frankly, advancing and changing how we review and consider our procedures to better reflect the expectations of our communities. And I'll close by acknowledging, Councillor, you uh, flagged something that I think is important. I flag as the chief, um, and you talked about the need for supervision. And we talked about the importance of supervision. I will tell you that this board will be presented a budget later this year. And part of our considerations that we've already started discussing is our supervisory needs. We are very much an organization that is young, very, very young, and we continue to get younger. The need for supervision, as we see in this procedure, uh, is incredibly important. And uh, the need for us to have our supervisory ranks staffed is incredibly important. At a future date, I will paint a picture for the board on where we are in that construct. Um, and it is something that's going to be uh, uh, presented as part of our budgetary considerations. And I just wanted to highlight that at this point. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chief. We also were fortunate uh, to have for new board members uh, a presentation from Deputy Johnson, Deputy Pogue. And one of the uh, parts of the presentations are the enormous number of vacancies uh, that exist for uh, uh, supervisors in, you know, detective and sergeant roles. So we're very mindful and thanks for uh, raising that and bringing it to our attention again because uh, we do understand the importance of, um, you know, uh, effective policing where there's a supervisory role, uh, both to training and to oversight. So thank you. Apparently, Councillor Chang, you, you had a motion. I, 
I, th I think they're. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, they're working. On Doobie it. and Diane are trying to draft. Uh, as they're drafting, I just um, as a follow up to Chief's um, comments, I wonder, do we have moments where we're executing search warrants where there isn't a supervisor available because of our staffing capacity? Has that happened? Is that in our current numbers? Is there increased risk that that can happen? So, so there is a requirement, obviously, to have a supervisor there. Mm. Um, you know, it, it, does that mean that there aren't instances? Um, you know, there's some contingencies in, contingencies in place. For instance, the ETF, they have team leads, and there are people who are given higher responsibility, not maybe not ne not necessarily the rank, but it is a requirement of the procedure, and we expect our um, our members to follow that. So, in terms of capacity, we haven't hit a moment where. Uh, um, a search warrant had to be executed without a supervisor present. So, uh, Councillor, I, I would say what, what ends up happening is if there's a search warrant that has to be executed, we start looking for a supervisor. Mm -hmm. So it'll either be from that unit, from another unit, mm -hmm. we will find somebody to, to do that. It's just a question of timing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, that's been practiced for a long time. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I think the trickle down is what I want to flag, because we may get a sergeant to the search warrant but that may mean there's a sergeant not available for something else. This is only one of many procedures mm -hmm. that require direct supervisory oversight, mm -hmm. notwithstanding our expectations that our young police department has adequate supervision in all they do, not just these individual procedures. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it's a broader issue. Mm -hmm. The search warrant procedure is only one mm -hmm. that requires a sergeant. Many, many, many procedures mm -hmm. have a procedural requirement for sergeants, and we have a requirement for supervision generally. Thank you. So I think uh, count, I, Councillor yes. uh, as well. Sorry, it's uh, James Cornish here again. Uh, I can tell you from my experience prosecuting in various places around the province uh, that the supervisory cadre of the Toronto Police is lean by comparison to other places. Thank you. All right. And we now have. Um, the uh, motion that's on the screen uh, by uh, Councillor Chang uh, reads uh, that the board uh, direct the chief to explore the inclusion of specific direction in the services procedure with regards to the execution of search warrants in the presence of children, including the execution and follow-up. I would have added maybe vulnerable persons as well, but... Um, <laughs> Um, because sure. you can have elderly or those with challenges. Um. Um, and I, I just, um, yeah, I put in this motion because um, I understand it's baked into some of the other trainings, but to have it in the procedure just acknowledges, because in that moment, you're looking after so many things, and without it explicitly <laughs> saying, here are the things we do, I think um, especially for youth and children in under-resourced communities, that could be their first interaction with police and it could really leave a lasting impact that could have negative consequences in their uh, future growth. So how we treat uh, young or vulnerable people in those critical moments uh, can strengthen our relationship with communities at large. So this is why I'm moving this motion. So, so uh, uh, let me just, mm -hmm. I, I think this makes perfect sense, but uh, when we were drafting the procedure, <clears throat> uh, we found that there are so many other aspects of our process that are touched that this could be a very, very long procedure um, and, and make it hard for officers to understand and remember. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I think this this merits some consideration subject to what the chief says, obviously. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, uh, it may well be that our procedure on uh, dealing with vulnerable people, which exists, covers this. Uh, so uh, I think what, what I'd suggest to the chief is that we can take this away and see if we need to incorporate more into the search warrant procedure or better link the vulnerable persons procedure with this one. So 
That, that could be accomplished by replacing the word procedure with governance and training. And then that allows us some flexibility as to how that in, infuses. Yes, I think you probably do find many of these uh, in various areas of both procedures, uh, you know, training, um, you know, execution of search warrants pursuant to the type of case law, relationships with community agencies. But it, 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 I think it's worth a discussion, as James said, just to see is there an area we need to tweak? Is there something that makes it easier if in training, you know, is it easier if it's codified? Um, having regard to all the dynamic situations that happen. Uh, when people are arrested in situations where there could be children or uh, dynamic situations. Um, did, do we have a seconder? I think to, I just wanted to close off Mr. Cornish's comments that um, I think he's right. However, uh, you know, notwithstanding, uh, starting to wordsmith, this, this motion certainly I think gives us enough flexibility that we can look at our entire governance framework in the context of what's being asked. Would you like to speak, or you're the seconder? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Councillor Grisanti. All right, all in favor? All right, so that motion is carried. Um, and I'm uh, asking um, if uh, <coughs> uh, we can receive the, uh, the presentation. Uh, Ms. Kostakis, seconded by Ms. Spencer, and all in favor? Thank you. Thank you, uh, um, Stefan, and uh, all, er, everyone else who spoke on this. Um, and now we move to um, item number three, which is the update on the Auditor General's recommendation implementations. And I believe um, <coughs> we have a presentation. Welcome. Chair, members of the board, uh, chief and uh, command. Um, my name is Tyrone Hilton. I'm the unit commander of our uh, strategy management unit. Uh, and we are here, just as was mentioned, to give an update on the AG's report. A year ago, we gathered here in June, uh, and we talked about some important work that needed to be done, uh, looking at two main areas, one being calls for service and looking at being more, more effective and more efficient in the way we deliver service and providing... Uh, community safety and well-being outcomes and improving that. And the second piece of that was looking at our 911 operations and how to streamline those processes as well. Um, a lot of important work has been done, a lot of collaborative effort between our, our partners at the city and, and different organizations. Uh, so um, we'll talk more about that. Uh, Emily Much, uh, here to my right, is a project leader in our office, a senior member of strategy management, and uh, she has a very good uh, presentation that she's prepared that we'll talk about uh, sort of where we've been, the journey we're on, and uh, where we're headed. So without further ado, I'll pass the, uh, the floor over to Emily. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, and uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to present today. Um, I do have some slides. A, sorry, this is a, it's a different presentation. <laughs> sorry, Ken. Uh, it's, uh, so this is, I think, for the next presentation. Yeah. Did you give them to us? Yes. To who? They're on the agenda. You got them. While we're waiting, um, I can just uh, give kind of a general update. Um, uh, as the superintendent mentioned, uh, my name is Emily Much, and I'm a project leader working in our strategy management unit. Uh, so this services strategy management unit has been uh, tasked with facilitating the implementation of 51 recommendations made by the City of Toronto's Auditor General um, in 2022. So 
the slides are uh, in the board agenda, so maybe I'll just uh, kind of move ahead forward just because I know everybody is uh, busy and uh, we want to kind of keep, keep the time short. Uh, we'll just move forward and give a verbal update. Um, uh, I, I, I don't with me, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So nice. Thank you so much. All right. Since the Auditor General presented three ports, reports to the board in June of 2022, the service has been working diligently to both drive and support implementation uh, efforts, and significant work's already been done in response to the recommendations made under two audit reports. Uh, those reports are uh, related to the review of police response to calls for service and an audit of the service's 911 operations. So uh, as outlined when the project implementation strategy was presented to the board in uh, November of 2022, all implementation planning work has been uh, aligned with uh, five key common themes that the Auditor General outlined in a capstone report. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. So these uh, five common themes you can see we've kind of condensed for brevity um, up on the screen. But within that capstone report, uh, the Auditor General notes that uh, there's no quick fix and careful consideration of, of all of this work needs to be done, uh, specifically with alternative non-police responses. At the June 2022 board meeting, a motion was moved to forward a copy of these, uh, sorry, <laughs> Get back to my spot here. At the June 2022 board meeting, a motion was moved to forward a copy of these reports to the city's audit committee for consideration. City council then considered and adopted two items from the city audit committee. A board report detailing these audit committee items was received by the board at the March 2023 meeting. The service has, together with the board and our city partners, ensured that a collaborative and multi-sector implementation structure is in place and supports all of our project work. The report that accompanies this presentation will be included as one of the inputs of a more fulsome update to the city's executive committee later in the year. So an important element of our implementation planning has been to follow a holistic approach to implementation and ensure that work is aligned with our services, other police reform initiatives. There are many of them, as you can see up on the screen. Early on in the planning process, each recommendation was analyzed and mapped to existing projects and initiatives. In order to better support our chief's priority to accelerate police reform and professionalization, our project team strategy has been to leverage work already underway where possible, ensuring that elements required to implement the AG's recommendations are built into related project plans and requirements. The cumulative effect of working through these numerous transformational change projects will continue to be a guiding consideration in the execution of project activities. Next slide, please. So the specific implementation work that's been completed to date for each of the 51 recommendations has been outlined in the report that accompanies this presentation. But there's a few key highlights to our work over the past 12 months that are important to share with you. Our budget development team worked quickly to address staffing challenges identified in the AG's reports and were able to include funding requests for imperative positions in our 2023 budget request. Units within our I and IT command have been working to better use data and technology to support TPS resources, and we've already begun to see an improvement in our data systems and measurement capacity as a result. We've established, or in some cases, restored, a number of working groups with relevant stakeholders to drive project progress. For example, the 911 committee returned to a regular cadence of meetings and have worked collaboratively to refine processes related to sea ambulance event calls. Additionally, our corporate communications unit have established a working group with their City of Toronto counterparts and have made significant progress on planning a public awareness campaign in response to one of the AG's recommendations. The achievements of the Toronto Community Crisis Service Program, which were reported to the board in April of 2023, have provided our implementation team with a framework around which to build future collaborative projects with our city partners. The most important focus of our work over the past 12 months has centered around building systems and communication channels to better foster collaboration. 
These efforts align with the city's key factors to achieve change, which include identifying key and shared outcomes as a part of strategic planning and collaboration, and using an evidence-based approach to inform decisions being transparent and accountable by tracking and reporting out publicly on progress against agreed plans and outcomes, and being committed and building trust and support between stakeholders as we move through barriers and difficulties towards common goals. Next slide. Thank you. So we recognize that significant work is still required to implement all of the AG's recommendations. And the focus on our next phase of work will be both on accelerating police reform and supporting safer communities. This work has presented us with a range of opportunity and we're excited for what's to come. So some of our next steps include uh, the services strategy management and communication services units um, have partnered with our Toronto Police Association on a data analysis project to identify optimal staffing and shift schedules for communication services members. We're currently preparing information packages to present to the impacted unit members, and we will be facilitating a vote in the fall to potentially pilot a new scheduling option beginning in January 2024. We'll also to con we will also continue to support work um, in other high-priority information technology projects, including the RMS replacement and NG911. Research work has begun related to exploring options for potential new alternative response initiatives with a goal of setting up meetings and creating a framework with our city agency counterparts before the end of the year. We'll also continue to support the important work being done by SafeTO, the Toronto Community Crisis Service, and the Gerstein Center Pilot. We've been working with our services budget development team to ensure that our funding required to support the public awareness campaigns is included in our 2024 budget request. And with the help and support of our information management pillar, planning has begun to launch a data analysis and modeling project for PRU officer staffing later this year. We'll be partnering with the TPA on this project and look forward to collaborating with them. Once we've developed the required data models, we'll be engaging the board to work together on establishing time targets for calls for service. Most importantly, we look forward to continuing to strengthen our relationships with our city partners and our other external stakeholders. These relationships are the most important component of acceleration efforts related to police reform. Through working closely together, we will foster better innovation and support more efficient processes. It's important to acknowledge these stakeholders and we really appreciate their willing participation and collaboration. In addition to offering our sincere thanks to the board and the board's staff, We'd also like to thank the Auditor General, Tara Anderson, and her team in the AG's office, City Manager Paul Johnson and the City Manager's office, Deputy City Manager Paul Raftis, and Director of Strategic Policy and Programs, Andrea Austin. We'd also like to acknowledge the work of Kate Bassel and Julia Moroso, both with the City of Toronto, in developing our implementation strategies. We'd like to thank the city divisions and agencies we've been collaborating with, including 311, the Housing Secretariat, City of Toronto Legal Services, Municipal License and Standards, Shelter Support and Housing Administration, Social Development, Finance and Administration, Strategic Public and Employee Communications, Toronto Community Housing Corporation, Toronto Fire Services, Toronto Paramedic Services, and Toronto Public Health. We'd like to thank the Toronto Police Association for their support and collaboration on a number of initiatives. And we'd like to thank members of our service who've worked exceptionally hard to support our implementation initiatives in these recommendations. Our chief in command, our senior management team, the members of our implementation steering committee, and all of our amazing service subject matter experts. We'd like to specifically acknowledge a number of service leaders who've really stepped up to support our project. Uh, Superintendent Justin Vander Hayden and Manager Carrie Murray Bates of Communication Services, Inspector Anthony Paoletta and Inspector Catherine Jackson, both former members of our Strategy Management Leadership Team, Ashling Murphy and Shannon Cartier of Corporate Communications, Marva Carter and Joseph Ariwi of Analytics and Innovation, and Lauren De Silva of the Data Management Team. Um, we'd also like to thank the entire team in our strategy management unit for their tireless work on helping to support this project. We're lucky to have had amazing leadership and guidance from Deputy Rob Johnson, James Cornish of the Chief's Office, Acting Staff Superintendent Lisa Crooker, Acting Staff Superintendent Joe Matthews, and Superintendent Tyrone Hilton. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Jennifer Gigante and Mira Gukul for all of their project management expertise, expertise and support. 
This has been a team effort, and we sincerely appreciate all of the collaboration work done to date. Last slide, please. As we continue in our implementation efforts, it's important to note that the efforts have been centered around principles of continuous improvement. We want to ensure that any changes we make can be supported long term and that we continue to strive to better support our communities the best we can. Our implementation efforts will not be an exercise in ticking off boxes on a checklist. We're forecasting the completion of um, implementation work on a number of these recommendations over the next 12 months, and we will include the results of AG verification efforts in our next annual update. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, a couple things uh, just on the record. Absolutely. So I just want to acknowledge that uh, the, the, the AG at the time said that, that uh, this was only the second time in her career of doing extensive audits where she recommended the hiring of more people. She also made a, an important um, uh, comment that, you know, this exercise is not a shift in lift, that you just can't have somebody take on a, a specific um, a piece of, of, of work and, mm -hmm. and just shift the budget over to, to cover for that. So that's an important uh, reminder. And, and lastly, just want to comment on, um, you, you know, some things that the AG and her team had said throughout, and it was, uh, you know, we were, we were blessed with uh, the leadership of, of Chief Raymer at the time that ensured that there were no barriers, that we were totally uh, committed to her investigation, and the cooperation between our service, strategy management, and uh, the, the city was uh, second to none. So th those were public comments that she made, and I just wanted to make sure that uh, folks here today heard that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Much, and I'd also like to thank the unit commander. Thank you. Thinking perhaps what we could do um, to allow um, Derek to make his deputation, and then we could hold all our questions because he may have some comments he wants to make on this presentation. So. Derek, uh, do you want to come forward to make your deputation? Then maybe any of the comments and questions we can have afterwards. Thank you. I just want to say by me speaking at this meeting, this shall not be deemed to be in any way my consent expressed or implied. And doing so is fraud. God bless His Majesty the King and long live His Majesty the King. And if Miguel here has ever led the Toronto Police to believe in any way that he is the surety for the person he has, then that would be a mistake and that I ask the Toronto Police to please forgive Miguel. Uh, one thing I ran out of time with on the last item that should be uh, should be mentioned on the uh, minutes was after the last month's meeting had been adjourned that Councillor Nunzietta blew a kiss at me and uh, while I don't think that's probably a conflict of interest uh, I have very good reasons to believe that Vice Chair Nunzietta is secretly in love with me. So in this report it says <laughs> Toronto <laughs> I will, Councillor Nunziata, and next time I start uh, clapping at Toronto City Council, you'll remind me, remind me of that. Toronto Auditor General's recommendation, Toronto Police Service Update Number 2, City Council requests the City Manager in consultation with the Toronto Police Services Board to reiterate the City's request for funding commitments from the Government of Canada and the Ontario Government to support permanent housing options and to provide supports to address Toronto's mental health and addiction crises. Toronto Police Service Update. The board and the service have and will continue to support the city and our agency partners with ensuring that funding for the social safety net is provided to support permanent housing options and mental health and addiction supports. In May 2023, Toronto City Council adopted a housing pledge to achieve or exceed the provincial housing target of 258,000 new Toronto homes by 2031. This target represents an ambitious goal and represents a 23% increase in Toronto's housing supply within 10 years. So it just so happens, I heard recently that I think Councillor Cheng here got, uh, landed a plum roll from uh, Mayor Chow about um, overseeing housing, I think, for, didn't, didn't I hear something about that? Oh, okay, well, I totally whiffed on that. I'm <laughs> Okay, but I, I had an idea anyway, since we're talking about housing for newcomers. I don't know if anyone has heard recently about the Bibby Stockholm Barge, where in the UK they will be using a barge to house uh, up to 500 refugees on it. 
Now, the best part about this is because I had a, a conversation with Councillor Cole when I bumped into him going around begging people to vote for him during the last election. And he was acknowledged that, uh, yeah, like the, there, not everyone, but there was a criminal element working out of the Roehampton Hotel. So I was thinking, well, one way to, to deal with that is, you know, maritime law. Because do you remember the season of Below Deck where Captain Sandy and <laughs> Malia the bosun, people thought they were being mean to Hannah the Chief Stew because, you know, all she did was bring drugs on board without registering it into the log. But they mentioned three times that under maritime law is very strict. And you're not gonna go on someone, board someone else's vessel and uh, mess around with, uh, and not follow the rules because you know there's that saying in maritime law about walking the plank. They take that stuff very serious. So an idea, because we got Lake Ontario right there, bring in a few barges and, uh, you know, cause, and to take care of that element that causes trouble in the past, work uh, of those um, hotels, uh, maritime law with its strictness will probably take care of it for uh, itself. So since this is a Auditor General related item, I wanted to point out that former Auditor General Beverly Romeo Beeler said to me in an email a while back, we have assigned an internal complaint tracking number to this matter, uh, 2021-0028. And please reference it in all <clears throat> future communications with our office. And I actually went to grew up with a guy who ended up becoming an accountant. And I'll never forget how he once told me that accounting is the basis of all truth. And as the integrity commissioner of the city of Toronto recently said, the Supreme Court of Canada has noted false and injurious statements are very tenuously related to the core values which underlie the freedom of speech protected by Section 2B of the Charter. They are inimical, which means hostile, to the search for truth. They do not enhance participation in public service or lead to healthy democratic debate. And he got that from Hill versus Church of Scientology of Toronto 1995, the Supreme Court of Canada. And the reason I mention this is because I'm still trying to find out on if it's true that Dr. Davila's husband has received money from COVID vaccine makers. So hopefully the Auditor General's office will get around to uh, resolving my complaint. That's it. Thank you. As it relates to items uh, 3.1, any questions? Sorry. <laughs> Ms. Uh, Councillor Chang. Thank you. Um, Francis, I didn't this see. is regarding um, Appendix A, uh, the recommendations and, uh, and status. So uh, with regard to our response time, which is uh, number six, I know, so Appendix A, number six, I think a lot of people are always concerned about our current response times. And I'm wondering, is there, has there been a jurisdictional scan across uh, North America with regard to response times um, in comparison to populations and size of police force? <laughs> I think it would be very informative to, especially as we're considering budget and you know walk, trying to figure out how we can reduce the response time. So, yeah. so I think I can address the response times because we uh, did a study, uh, a fairly in-depth study of response times last year. It was 18 months ago. Um, uh, so, uh, looking at benchmarks, um, a lot of services are fairly um, tight to the chest in terms of, um, of sharing um, their actual times, um, but benchmarks um, uh, across the U.S. tend to be around six, seven um, uh, minutes, um, uh, some as high as ten minutes, um, but uh, we are well be above that, and usually the benchmark is a severity one or a priority one call um, and how fast we get to those. So what we're seeing is um, uh, last time it was 20, 19, 20, 21 minutes. It's growing uh, response times to severity ones on average. Um, but that doesn't tell the whole story. What's actually happening is there's a sacrificing of response times to lower priority calls, which are climbing into the four, five, um, six hour range um, uh, for responses to severity fours, severity fives. Um, uh, uh, to try and um, keep the severity ones um, uh, at, at, uh, at that nominal 20, 20 minutes. So we're almost double the benchmark. So um, 
Am I hearing that other police forces are not? Because I think we're quite public about our response times, um, different level calls, different level times, but other police forces across North America are not um, public about this information? They're, they're public about the, um, the benchmark that they uh, strive to achieve. And in some cases, they actually uh, s uh, staff um, off of those uh, benchmarks. So in the example of LA, um, they will set, this is the benchmark, this is the staffing we need to achieve that um, response time benchmark, and so therefore this is going to drive the, the, the staffing. But they don't give the actual times, uh, uh, response times um, that they're achieving. Um, so uh, we have benchmarks, we have policies that would indicate that that benchmark is being followed or being met, but we don't have the actuals. Um, and in many cases, we have trouble getting the actuals data. Um, we um, have taken a different perspective under the sort of product management, service management um, uh, lens. We're trying to be as transparent and public as we can about all of our performance data, um, and that includes uh, response times. So we have shared probably more than most, well, definitely more than most um, uh, uh, services have around response times in order to make transparent um, uh, the challenges and operations that we're under. And that was, in fact, um, fed to the, um, uh, the AG. Um, and the AG replicated our analysis um, and found, actually, we were a minute longer um, in our um, SEV1 response times. Uh, just something else that I'll yeah. add, just quickly, just specific to jurisdictional scans. Um, last September, we had a very comprehensive jurisdictional scan of LAPD, so a contingent of, of members of our strategy management unit, along with uh, Dr. Kenan Gisser and, and a couple of members of the TPA, uh, attended LA, and um, we were able to kind of do a deep dive into their business processes uh, to help kind of inform the work that we're doing to increase our response times. So mm -hmm. um, we learned a lot, and um, we're looking forward to uh, implementing some of that work in, in our uh, implementation work with our recommendations. Well, I think this um, highlights the strength of our police force that we are transparent uh, in comparison to apparently all of North America. That's really, I hope that our city and our residents appreciate that tran transparency. Uh, but it does also illustrate such a difficult um, situation because I do hear from constituents um, say increasingly, I no longer call the police um, because I can't get an answer, I've waited hours, um, and so or no one came until two days later. So this is something that I think we will continue to address. The other uh, question I have is about recommendation 10, um, about the you know 70-30 reactive versus proactive. So this is something that I think is a great goal, but given our current capacity, is it even possible for us to, because it says that we're in progress, but that progress, the efforts are actually focused on creating a data framework of time spent doing proactive work versus reactive work. And proactive would mean, I think, community relationship building or uh, crime prevention activities. What is the actual likelihood that we could get to a point where our police force could use 30% of their time to do proactive work? So, so this was this is a lofty goal, and we we always set that as, as a benchmark. It's an internationally known um, sort of um, um, goal that that you know a lot of organizations have set. The reality is, as you, as you just heard, we can't um, even respond to priority one calls in in a, in a timely manner. Um, so we have to fix that before we can do anything that's proactive. Um, you know, when when can we do that? I'm not sure. I mean, that's that's stuff that we're working through right now. We do capture. Uh, uh, officer uh, priority response time and, and then um, um, you know unstructured time as well right but uh, we're nowhere near the 70-30. So you know the, in the legend there's a legend here for this chart and I, I feel like it needs an additional response which is impossible with current resources or the current because it's, it's saying it's in progress but in truth, we can't. We can't get to a point where, and that means that our police can't actually do the important 30% work that is a benchmark. And and so, you know, I think yeah. the truthful, like, uh, and I know it's not in your legend, but maybe there needs to be a new category so that 
we understand the context of how difficult it is to get to that 30%. So, so one of the things to, to be mindful of as well is that, you know, every officer is, is given uh, a list of things that we would like them to do if they have unstructured time, right? And, so, and the majority of times right now they can't, that's a reality. But as Deputy Pogue just mentioned to me, uh, as a reminder, we do have uh, dedicated units who do um, uh, proactive stuff uh, as part of their daily duty. So there is that work going on. Uh, the 7030 is is geared to a priority response uh, unit mm -hmm. uh, to augment that. So it's not that we're not doing any proactive work uh, in in this city in this organization. We are. Um, it's just that the the front line is is where we're not meeting that standard. And, and I'm not saying all of this as a criticism. I hope you know that. I'm just trying to, um, you know, emphasize that we are obviously stretched in resources, and I think it's so important that because I think the it's, it's good that we have special groups that are doing the proactive work, but ideally our response officers, because that 30% is relationship building. Um, and without that 30%, we're just not in the healthiest idealized version of the police force that I think we all uh, wish we could be. Councillor, uh, before you move on, I, I would like an opportunity sure. just to uh, address uh, uh, your comments thus far, and uh, I don't think we can agree more with you. Um, I think there's uh, the reality is it's something we spoke of last year in our budget cycle that we are focused on course, course service delivery, and that it was a multi-year plan. Mm -hmm. I'll highlight that in 2010, uh, our statistics show that our actual response times were down to 13 minutes, but in 2010 we had 5,600 police officers. In 2010, the city was smaller than it is today. Uh, we have grown exponentially as a city while the service has declined um, in a significant number of uh, available resources and the complexity of our work has grown uh, exponentially during that same time. Uh, so I, I really just want to take a moment and say acknowledge that we couldn't agree more with you. The importance of the 30%. I said on December 19th that I was committed to building trust in and within the Toronto Police Service. To build trust, we need those opportunities for that 30% or more, but certainly 30%. Proactive time where we can actually build the relationships that are so important uh, to forge a, a trusting environment and to create a greater sense of security in our city. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, so with regard to AG number 11 of Addendum A, um, I'm just wondering, is there currently a data framework to see how policing hours are distributed by category and need? For example, time spent ticketing, time spent working on neighbor issues or investigating major crimes uh, or level one, two, or three emergencies. Is that data something we're currently collecting or is it something we're working on so that we can actually capture how our resources are allocated to the different policing needs in our city? Um, so I guess that is something that, uh, that is uh, a work in progress. Um, one of the things that, um, as our CIO mentioned, that we're trying to do um, with our um, kind of service delivery framework mm -hmm. is make sure that we're properly kind of mapping um, the time that we're spending to the, to the money that it's, it, that it's taking. Mm -hmm. So it certainly is a consideration in our project work and, and probably by our next update we'll have a, probably a more fulsome um, So I don't, I don't know if you noticed, but in the, in the, the call outs, um, the in information uh, management team um, is working on this specifically. So the attorney, uh, the um, auditor general, um, uh, was uh, critical of the um, of the, the framework that we have. We have a framework. We've been able to iterate it over the last year um, and to move it forward. But we don't think we're done in terms of um, augmenting the measurement and the um, the the, the tie-in between their activity um, dollars spent. Um, and that's also part of the um, uh, product management service management um, uh, lane that we're, mo we're we're moving on. Um, this will also come back to investments we're making in records management solutions um, and um, uh, officer documentation that are going to help drive the information that we need to be able to, uh, to um, understand where they're spending their time more. Great. There's a lot of uh, technology that supports that. Um, AG number 16, um, it's so encouraging that we're working on video, uh, especially in a multicultural multilingual city. There are times when I'm sure there are people who can't speak English but need help and video 911 is something that can really 
be a game changer. And I'm wondering if we've also done a jurisdictional scan, as I was recently in the country of tai Taiwan, Taipei, in uh, March for a Smart City Summit, and they have video 911. Uh, and have we, you know, I guess, learned, because I think it's legislative, operational, and technical pieces that uh, are important considerations. So it's, it's definitely in the scope of work um, that we are going to be looking at. I think that specific recommendation, if I'm not mistaken, kind of spoke more to the calls for service answering. Um, so um, there is also work being done on the 911 side of the house. Um, our plan is to kind of ex uh, leverage some of our existing um, relationships in working groups. Uh, so for example, we're part of a, a, a public policy innovation working group, but our strategy man management unit participates in that, so working with other services and seeing um, if they have any lessons learned or if they're you know, working together so that we're not just kind of working alone. Um, but I think we'll also really need to uh, lean on some of our um, external stakeholders for that. So for example, like the IPC, just to make sure we're also balancing equity concerns and privacy concerns. And um, in the case of uh, 911 specifically, um, we also want to make sure that anything we put in place um, is informed by some, um, we, we consider things like wellness and trauma on, on the members that are going to be mm -hmm. watching the videos. Mm -hmm. So these are all considerations that we've included in our project plan. Mm -hmm. And then this is for Appendix B, last question. Uh, actually, it's a two-part question. So there is a consideration to change the non-emergency number to a three number, which I think would be so beneficial. I actually had someone suggest it should be 811 because it's not exactly 911. It could be 811 um, and just letting people know because all the time um, people probably call 911 because it's the number they remember and they probably, no one has, or not no one, but in, nobody really remembers phone numbers anymore. But it, the order of activities in the AG report suggests that we're going to do an education campaign and then decide whether or not uh, another number should be implemented. But actually, if we're going to do an education campaign, that should probably happen after that decision has been made. And, and I'm wondering, you know, what is the cost to change a non-emergency to a three number? Because I, I, I just intuitively, I think it would really decrease Wrong, num wrong calls going to 911. And secondly, you know, I also see like making the right call is like an information campaign that I've tried to support in my own communications with my community. But when I see the budget that's being asked for $250,000, that will not penetrate the city the way that I think we need it to penetrate the city to decrease the load that we're hoping uh, so that people do make the right call. But on the other side of that, the challenge is, you know, I've had people in my community say calling non-emergency, they've been on hold for two and a half hours. So you need the non-emergency capacity, but then you still, you know, no matter what that capacity is, having an easier number will reduce the wrong calls to 911. So there's like a few questions in there. Um, you can speak to your point's well taken, and we agree 100%. Um, it would be ideal to have a simplified number, and I, I believe that is something we're going to work towards. But one of the things that we wanted to keep in mind before we kind of start doing that work to look at um, how much it's going to cost and what the impacts will be of changing is just making sure that we are um, doing some other public awareness to really decrease the number of non emergency calls that are coming in. Um, with 211 and 311, it's important for people to kind of know which number to call, but at the same time, we don't want to discourage people from calling 911 when there's an emergency. That's a very important piece that needs to be um, included as well. Um, so the idea with the public awareness campaign is it's not going to be a one and done. We're going to be um, working through it um, whether we haven't um, established yet if it's going to be annually, but generally at least once every two years we're going to be putting up more. Um, so this uh, campaign is going to expand. Um, and I believe um, if it hasn't already, but soon enough we'll also um, have 988 included into the numbers as well. So we want to make sure that we can kind of um, do some measurement, see, we'll put out some awareness information and, and start our campaign. It's already started, um, you know, even though we don't have the, the funding to do the, the larger campaign, we've already started to do some um, 
some work between the city and ourselves to just kind of, you know, I think um, information was put out recently just to try to get people to um, stay on the line if they dial 911 not by accident. So this work is kind of going to be one that isn't just a, a one-year thing. It's going to have to take a few years, I think. We, we really want to be able to measure the impact of the public awareness campaign before we look at um, what would happen if we put a new non-emergency number in the mix. Well, it should be fun, and it should be viral, and you should get the, the officer that's on TikTok who has a huge following. He should just take hold of this communication campaign and uh, let it go viral on social media, but I would think that expediting consideration of a three number would really um, s serve the city and the service, so. So we, we, we have 311. Um, yeah. uh, and we also have, um, and so there's, there's, a, there's a constellation of groups around this. Um, as a municipality, we have other municipalities that would, we should harmonize um, uh, the, the numbers um, so that everyone's following the same pattern, right? Um, and the, so the timelines for that are relatively long because of the coordination and building consensus around um, how we're going to proceed in those areas. The other thing that's going to take time is the um, NG911 infrastructure and the cutover to it, and so the video pieces. So what we're looking at in the short term is how do we cope with a now issue uh, when those types of solutions are potentially <laughs> years out? Um, and that means public education on some pieces, um, as well as creating um, uh, ways to divert calls quickly when we establish on 911 that they're not emergency because the non-emergency line has such poor performance, because we don't have enough call takers, um, uh, then uh, we have to create digital methods of uh, reporting that are more responsive and more attractive to pull people towards those digital um, uh, solutions. We have just gone live with the, um, the parking complaints um, piece, and we're hoping to template that out um, uh, to cover more and more of the, uh, the situations and use a full range of digital responses from video to um, online reporting um, uh, to, to cover all the, the situations. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And just on, on your point, I understand that these are in the report action items, and most of them are in progress as it relates to data collection or, uh, you know, the IT required to do next generation 911 video and text and all the other action items. And so we will get regular board updates, and that's why, you know, you did put in those action items, but uh, most of them are works in progress, not to mention the resource issue to uh, you know, decrease our calls, which means bodies both that, you know, communications, it means bodies on the street, it, it means other agencies taking the call, like alternative crisis delivery, et cetera. And, and I believe uh, Vice Chair Nancy yes. has been waiting a long time, so questions. she has a question. Uh, just a few, a few questions. First of all, the report that we have, and I'm on the audit committee as well at the city. Um, this audit um, was recommended in 2021, uh, correct? And these recommendations were put forward, and this is just your update now where you are as of today. So my question is, uh, I know that part of the report is that uh, you need approximately two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars, and I'm and I know we discussed it previously that with the auditor's report and recommendations, we would have to add resources and funding into our budget. So for this year's budget, is all this included? or you, you're projecting it for the next budget cycle? So um, to the extent things were estimated um, during the last year's budget process to feed into 2023, we have built those in. So as an example, you know, one of the initiatives is the RMS project. We have a whole capital program around it. There is work being done around um, Enveronics and kind of sizing that was mentioned that is funded in year. Um, this was an ask that sort of happened in year, and so we will be putting it in to the 2024 budget ask in addition to any other pieces of the recommendation where we're ready and we can estimate it, we will be flagging that in right. the budget process. Right, because we did discuss it previously mm -hmm. with our budget. So when yeah. you put the request in through your budget process, you will itemize it and indicate 
that the reason for the increase is the recommendation from the audit. So when it gets to council and the, uh, the councillors are questioning why, so they have a better understanding yes. on the on the reason for yes, the for absolutely. the increase. Okay, because that's really important because we don't want to go through what we went through the last time. No, we don't. Um, so then my um, my question to is. Um, so as far as recommendation 23, um, uh, as far as uh, noise, uh, parties and noises, noise, I think it's right, yeah, recommendation 23, uh, where uh, police respond to noisy parties. So as far as this, this issue, I know that the, you're in progress, status is in progress, but um, with MLS, uh, what is the communication with MLS and with the police? Because what's happening, that's still happening out there, is that when residents contact um, 311 uh, because of a noisy party, they're told, call the police. Um, and so there's a lot of confusion there. So, yeah, so I, I just not want to know, like, what is the, the re, uh, response from MLS? Because it's still... A real problem out there and we really don't know really what is happening on that because we're getting mixed communication because um, I get calls all the time and I, and you know people the residents are frustrated because they really don't know and we understand that it's not a 911 call and it's not a police so if you can just maybe elaborate a bit on that recommendation. Absolutely. So um, one of the things that we've kind of done um, is uh, we've set up kind of um, specific working groups around um, these various recommendations. So those working groups are kind of set up by the deputy city manager's office. Um, mm -hmm. And um, we've already had some discussions. I think one of the big challenges with this one is um, we don't want to put into uh, place any new programs that are going to... Um, impact them negatively so we need a lot of study and communication before we can start uh, looking at specific programs um, the difference between our service and the mls is that you know we're a 24 7 operation so if a noisy party complaint comes in where they don't have capacity to respond uh, you know right now that is uh, the case you know, it, we're going to need to kind of build some systems and processes and, and they'll likely need some additional resources in order to be able to respond kind of as quickly as our service can. Um, that being said, it is a, it's an important one. That's one of the six that the uh, Auditor General identified as kind of the, um, the best places for us to look at kind of um, taking work off of our plate. And um, I, I think we're, we're hopeful that we can start some discussions with them um, in the coming months just to kind of get a framework put together to look at how to best kind of address that specific piece. Right. So um, we, uh, did, sorry. we did hear, oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. No, it's due. Um, um, just, we, we have uh, people from the city online. Uh, Joseph Friedman Burley, I just wanted to check if uh, you had something to add on this point. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Hi. Thanks for having us here. Um, to the chair, thank you, Councillor, uh, for that question. Um, so uh, we, we are aware of the ongoing consultations as well that MLS is doing around the, the noise bylaw and the partnerships uh, that we are uh, looking to strengthen between MLS and, uh, and uh, the Toronto Police Service. So uh, just kind of echoing uh, what was said already and, and looking forward to uh, building on and expanding on this information when we come to uh, executive committee in the fall with a more fulsome update on the status of these AG right. recommendations uh, on the city side of things. Okay, now at the last council meeting, um, and we heard from MOS, is that they don't have enough officers to enforce bylaws, um, especially since uh, 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 some of the councillors uh, voted to have drinking in parks. I didn't, I have enough problems. Uh, but anyway, um, and we were told by MLS, so you're absolutely correct. They call TPS because they're 24 seven, but MLS, they have like, they're there to 8.30 to 4.30 or 5 or whatever. They're rarely working at 2 in the morning or on weekends. So it has to be coordinated uh, through MLS for some of these ongoing issues, which is a big problem. And I think the city should take some of that responsibility because we can't just throw it on the police uh, because they're available 24-7. And that's where there's a lot of problems <coughs> in the community. Well, my last question, 
Um, is this working group that you have on most of the recommendations, is it the same working group or are there various working groups? Because some of the uh, uh, status is that there's a working group form. So is it just one or a number of working groups? There's quite a few working groups and I guess oh. it depends on the scope of work. So just as an example, um, I know that our communication services team have a working group with uh, Toronto Paramedics and Toronto Fire and they've been addressing a lot of the recommendations made in the 911 um, audit but also there's some in the calls for service that they've been working on the sea ambulance calls. Um, so what the Deputy City Manager's Office did was they kind of put together a structure and kind of identified or, or like grouped recommendations together where they, um, based on, on um, the information that went to the audit committee last year. Um, and so I believe, I don't know the exact number, but it, I believe it's eight or nine um, different ones that kind of are working together. So our, our corporate communications working group um, is just, excuse me, uh, is just uh, corporate communications members, kind of specific experts in that field working together. Right, and Toronto Housing is, uh, is part of this as well, I see in one year record. So thank you very much. That, those are my questions. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, so at this point, do I have a motion to approve uh, the... Uh, thank you, Vice Chair, and seconded by uh, Lisa. All in favor? Seeing uh, no one opposed, uh, the motion is carried. Um, we're now at um, item number four, professionalism and uh, accountability. Um, we have both the report at 4.2 by the chief, and I understand as well we have Staff Superintendent Peter Cove to uh, give us a presentation. Thank you, Peter. Thank Thanks very much. I'm just waiting for the presentation to come up. We have it. Um. Is it set up yet? Uh, it is. Security policy kicked us out because we were waiting. locked because Thanks very much for the uh, for the patience. 
our security systems in a police service, of course, time out, and then we have to re-log in and so on. A moment ago, I was saying, going to say good morning, but now I'll say good afternoon, Chair Morgan, Toronto Police Service Board members, Chief in Command, and all those in attendance in person, but also that are joining us virtually. My name is Peter Code. I'm a staff superintendent with the Toronto Police Service. It's certainly my pleasure to be able to present to you the June 2023 report for professionalism and accountability. Since just September of 2022, professionalism and accountability has been comprised of three separate units of operation, awards and recognition, professional standards, and risk analysis and assessment. My presentation this afternoon will be specific to the material provided in the June report. It will cover the work complemented, or, or sorry, completed in these three areas, and how it is that we are investing in our people, highlighting areas where we excel, focusing on areas where we can improve, and showcasing where we provide support to our members so that they may make the best decisions when serving our communities. Certainly, one of the most progressive ways to inspire individuals within our own membership and to motivate them to perform their duties professionally and with accountability is not through the over-reliance of discipline to curb behavior, but rather through the showcasing of positive role models within our own members for others to emulate. Our Awards and Recognition Unit does just that. Led by Ms. Elaine Wong, our Awards and Recognitions Unit leads the way in highlighting what our members and community partners, colleagues and friends already know, that our members by and large are committed to our communities, that they face personal danger and risk to protect others, and are selfless in their acts. A number of examples are found within our report to illustrate this. I'm going to highlight a few of them very quickly now. Igor Zhrajko, our 2022 Police Officer of the Year, awarded for chasing after two would-be carjackers on foot and while off duty, and when one of the offenders turned back to face him, brandished a handgun and fired at Officer Zhrajko, narrowly missing him. Zhrajko did not give up his pursuit, but gained ground, caught up to, and arrested the offender. Mr. Randy Brenham, the recipient of our Civilian Excellence Award for sourcing, purchasing, stocking, and distributing personal protective equipment during the worldwide COVID-19 pandemic, while shortages of such equipment were occurring worldwide. His actions allowed the members of the Toronto Police Service to continue to keep our community safe in the face of a highly contagious virus. Officers John Amatuzio, Stephen Zaduj, Mihail Kokonov, Rebecca Godro, Laura Makassi, and Stephen Hawley, all working together as a team, saved the life of a man who was dangling out of an eighth floor high-rise high window in Toronto. Their actions saved his life and allowed him to get the medical and professional assistance that he so desperately needed. Neighborhood officers, Michael Harris and Amandeep Mali, through their own proactive engagements, conversations, caring and understanding, were able to identify and rescue two separate women who had been exploited and forced into the sex trade, both of whom had been trafficked by their captors for extended periods of time. And finally, Sergeant Matthew Daigle and Constable Harpreet Zahoda, who ran to a crowded shopping mall, responding to the frenzied attack of a man armed with machete, and who, when approached by officers, drew a handgun from his backpack and pointed it at both of them. The offenders responded with de-escalation techniques, less lethal options, disarmed the man, apprehended him, and got him the professional medical assistance that, again, he so, oft so desperately required. There are countless others from within our service and our communities who were recipients of corporate awards sponsored by our Toronto Police Services Board, highlighting acts of heroism, of empathy, and understanding, of professionalism, of accountability, and becoming the role models and mentors for our service as a whole to look up to and emulate. In all, Ms. Wong and her assistant, Ms. Frida Age, facilitated 881 internal awards presented by the Toronto Police Services Board to members of the Toronto Police Service, members of the community, and members of other policing and emergency services. A number of these events are highlighted in greater detail within our report that you have, but by scanning this QR code here in the presentation, however, it's also found in your report, it'll take you to the Police Excellence Awards website, chronicling the excellent work by our members within the last year and historically from years past as well. For the community to have trust in a police service, also means a framework has to exist to ensure that officers are held accountable for their actions. The Office of the Independent Police Review Director is the civilian oversight agency that is responsible for external complaints against our members. Their mandate, to ensure that public complaints about the police are dealt with in a manner that is transparent, 
effective and fair to both the public and to the police. The Special Investigations Unit is mandated to assure the public that actions of the Ontario's police service officials that result in serious injury or death, the discharge of a firearm at a person, or an allegation of sexual assault are subject to rigorous independent investigations. Information including statistical data and reports of investigation are available through the QR codes for each agency depicted here, but also found within your report. For each of these independent agencies, the Professional Standards Investigative Unit assists by seizing equipment and evidence, facilitating interviews with members, facilitating resolutions with community, and investigating alleged misconduct. Professional Standards Investigative Unit also conducts these same tasks for internal complaints made about the conduct of our own members. However, unless the matter is substantiated and is heard at a police tribunal, which is beyond the purview of professionalism and accountability, Section 95 of the Police Services Act prohibits me from reporting on these statistics today. Taking a closer look. Taking a closer look at the data provided by the SIU, their mandate was invoked in 69 different scenarios in 2022 one above the five-year average of 68. Figure 6.1 found within our report will provide you with a detailed breakdown of when the mandate was, with, was withdrawn, when an officer was exonerated, when an officer was charged, or when a matter was still ongoing at the time of the collection of data. Figure 6.2 identifies the reasons for SIU investigations. I have highlighted the totality of 2022 for your reference, as well as the totals for this uh, last year and the totals of the five-year average. A closer look at the data available from the OIPRD shows an increase in the number of cases received from the community relating to the Toronto Police Service in 2022, which was 859 over the five-year average of 738. However, of those cases, 320 were screened in by the OIPRD as meeting their mandate, which is a decrease from 352 cases of the previous year. Figure 3.7 indicates the disposition of complaints screened by, in by the OIPRD, depicting that misconduct was substantiated against our officers about 7% of the time, but also depicting resolutions were brought about between our members and those from within the communities that made the complaints about 14% of the time. Of the allegations of misconduct that have been screened in, Figure 3.2 shows that the great majority relate to discre discreditable conduct at 43%. And a further breakdown of what discreditable conduct looks like shows that allegations here in figure 3.3 shows that by and large acting in a disorderly manner rules the day by taking about 75 percent of all discreditable conduct allegations. But I would like to bring your attention to the subclassification of incivility shown here as making up about nine percent of the discreditable conduct allegations and I bring that up because in 2021 incivility accounted for only six percent of the discreditable conduct allegations. Allegations of incivility within our service are on the rise. So the question the service has is why are they on the rise and what can we do to mitigate this? And my belief is that we need to invest in our people. They are our people. All of them joined to keep us safe. All of them joined with a focus on community safety and well-being. And by invest, I do not mean in dollars and cents. I mean in time, commitment, support, empathy and compassion and this is why I believe this. Enter Dr. Linda Duxbury of the Carleton University Sprott School of Business. Dr. Duxbury has completed two studies in relation to police officers that I'm going to refer to today. I've been lucky enough to discuss these findings with Dr. Duxbury as recently as two weeks ago. The first study was done in 2013 when she surveyed over 2,500 police officers from across Canada, municipal, provincial and federal police officers. The second study was conducted in 2021, when she surveyed over 1,000 federal police officers. Her goal in both cases was to assess the well-being of officers who provide an essential service, frontline officers, the officers most likely to be the ones at the end of an allegation of incivility. What she found in both studies was incredibly consistent. However, in the second study, the more current study, she found that the results to be much more startling. Simply put, the officers that she surveyed and interviewed were not well. Not well, but still going to work. And if you consider that officers are, not, or sorry, are coming to work when they are fatigued or when they are mentally not well, what is the likelihood of them making mistakes, taking shortcuts, perhaps saying things that they should not? What is the likelihood 
of an allegation or action of incivility. I'm not stating all of this so that we can be sympathetic towards officers. I'm stating this because there must be a way for us to be able to invest in our police, and again I say our police, so that they can do the best job that they can and want to do. And so enter the early intervention program. Championed by Detective Deanna Gagliardi, who is in charge of our risk analysis and assessment unit, the third and final unit of professionalism and accountability, and here today to answer any questions that you may have. The purpose of this tool, the Early Intervention Program, is to identify TPS members that are displaying at-risk behavior and then engage with them as early as possible to reduce the risk of behavior escalating to an act of incivility, poor decision-making, misconduct. So how does this system work? It tracks past behavior and past behavior frequency to provide alerts to the risk analysis and assessment team. Behavior such as complaints through the OIPRD, investigations conducted by the SIU, vehicle collisions, civil litigation, uh, exposure to critical incidents, and an enormity in the number of times an officer uses force, even if it is justified. And if a threshold number or combination of numbers is met, an alert is generated. The team reviews the alerts provided and then based on the review, connects with that member's immediate supervisor so that they can engage with the member in a meaningful way and provide tools if required. It's very interesting because early today we had a presentation from Beyond the Blue as one of those uh, options or actions to be taken. The supports and tools that are available to our members from our, from our wellness unit are first class. They are hands-on and they work. A mental health continuum allows a supervisor uh, and member or a member on their own to self-diagnose and get the assistance they need. By simply taking a look at what are a person's symptoms, such as a restless or disturbed sleep, they can take a look at the continuum and identify a number of actions that they can take for self-care, including in identifying nurturing, and support, uh, nurturing support systems, but they can also identify options for care such as a registered psychotherapist or psychologist. If, when taking a look at an individual's own symptoms, the symptoms are a tired, low energy, muscle tension, and headaches feeling, quite simply, the continuum shows the actions to take, maybe engaging in a healthy lifestyle and coping strategies, but also uh, interacting or going, going to get peer support, which is, again, what we spoke about or what we heard from Beyond the Blue earlier today. The options for support tool provided by our wellness unit also allows members to find answers on who to go to for information, where to get peer support, how to get short-term counseling, and how to connect with a medical health expert. Or, with such an early intervention alert, a supervisor could consider the option of teaming one of our uh, members up with another officer who is trained by our Toronto Police College and is proficient in act, as an active bystander. And so the term, an active bystander, someone who will step in before an officer makes a bad decision or acts with bad judgment, mitigating the scenario, calming tempers, preventing incivility and other misconduct, allowing others to be at their best, allowing others to do what they joined our service to do, positively impacting community safety and well-being. In 2022, there was an increase of almost 56% in the number of alerts that were generated. This can primarily be accounted for an increase in hiring as we made a threshold significantly lower for probationary constables. We also made the threshold for those equipped with body-worn cameras significantly lower so that when an alert is made, conduct of an officer may be viewed on a video recording. I will close by returning to the photograph of our newly graduated recruits officers that have embarked on a career to perform their duties professionally and with accountability. Professionalism and accountability will celebrate their good deeds, provide them supports in time to mitigate bad decision making, but will also investigate and hold members accountable in matters of misconduct. All of this information and more can be found within the Professionalism and Accountability June 2023 report that you have. I certainly thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure to present to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at this time, rather than um, asking uh, for questions um, from the board, I'm wondering whether or not, uh, with uh, Chief Command Team and board members, if you'll indulge me, we have a number of deputations, one of which is Mr. Shellnut, and we've, he's been, uh, we've had some technical difficulties, so he's on the line now. Rather than uh, um, 
um, take questions first and then hear from the deputants. I wonder if we could have that indulgence. We'll do that and then we can wrap up by questions yeah, and comments on the end. First, yeah, all right. So thank you. Uh, uh, the first deputation we have is from Mr. David Shelnut. Good morning, Mr. Shelnut. Uh, morning and afternoon. That, that's very kind. Uh, I, I definitely didn't need you to do that, but I appreciate it very much. Um, I'll just get going then. Um, uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, in 2011, I was a student at Parkdale Community Legal Services. Uh, we used to receive a reasonable amount of people coming in with compl police complaints, um, but the clinic-wide policy was not to dedicate clinic resources to these complaints because they were ineffective as a police accountability tool. Now, in 2023, my own law firm receives several intakes a month uh, from people with possible complaints. And I'm unfortunately in the same position of having to tell people it's likely not worth the stress, time, and resources to proceed with a complaint. Um, and the complaint data, and, and thanks um, uh, to the officer that just showed some of that, it bears it out. And, and it's worth taking a look at in a more in-depth way, uh, which I won't do. Sometimes we do initiate complaints, either in concert with injury case or where we feel duty bound. Uh, I'm here today with Mr. Connor Engels, uh, a case we are assisting on pro bono. Uh, Mr. Engels will explain his complaint, but I'd like to explain the chronology uh, as it's indicative of the inaccessibility of the current complaint system and, and a lack of accountability. On Ju July 21, 2021, Mr. Engels witnessed police violence at Lamport Stadium uh, encampment clearing and associated demonstration at TPS 14 division, filed a complaint with numerous alle allegations. His complaint was rejected uh, or screened out by OIPRD, um, who stated witnesses of police misconduct, third parties could not file complaints. Uh, this is, of course, contrary to the Police Services Act, uh, which states they can. Um, his, the law was ignored and his file was closed. The only option was to walk away or file a judicial review at divisional court. Uh, at great expense, we did file that review uh, and lawyers for the OIPRD agreed with our position. Uh, we got a order for the OIPRD to screen in his complaints plus $1,500 in costs for our time. TPS Professional Standards was then tasked with reviewing their own officers' behavior in this highly contentious encampment and clearing complaint. Uh, they investigated a relatively minor complaint on the previous day's clearing, but the report made no mention of Mr. Engel's Lamport or 14 Division complaints. We thought, since they were so complex and involved so many officers, that it was still being investigated. And the website, the OIPRD website, confirmed that. Months later, we followed up. Uh, and TPS professional standards said, no, these complaints were screened out again. Uh, when pressed by our office, uh, TPS stated that because the complaints were based on social media video, they were not. Um, and Mr. Engels was a third party, again, uh, an investigation was not needed. Uh, when we asked the OIPRD to re review this TPS decision, despite their website informing us the complaint was still under review, they said our 60-day window for requesting a review had passed. Now, Mr. Engels is again left with no option but to either drop his complaints or proceed back to divisional court. I don't have to underscore how incredibly inaccessible this is. Without a legal team behind you, I question how a regular citizen would fare. This case is not alone, and we're advancing many others, and I, I don't have time to go through them today, but I'm always happy to chat about this. Um, jumping, jumping over a bit uh, to something else, recently, uh, TPS released a video of a motorist hitting an officer on a bicycle in Parkdale uh, during the course of arrest. Good. Uh, it's important for the public to see road violence on our streets, uh, and we hope the officers recover and well. But this too speaks to accountability. Our office is embroiled in an Information and Privacy Commission complaint uh, or appeal fight uh, that's lasted months, wherein TPS refuses to release the video of my client a young black U of T student on his way to school being tasered repeatedly uh, and a knee placed on his neck. Why can TPS release videos that generate sympathy for their officers, but refuse to lay bare the anti-black violence that continues to occur for greater public scrutiny? The current regime uh, is, in my estimation, unfortunately broken and accountability generally is fleeting. 
uh, as a lawyer, I find the process time consuming, inaccessible, faulty, and, and if I'm being honest, at times demoralizing. As a citizen, I oscillate between sadness and fear. Um, we truly do not have appropriate oversight and control necessary to ensure those we place our ultimate trust in and pay over a billion dollars for are living up to the highest standard and are accountable if mistakes or worse are occur. Thank you. Sorry, uh, Mr. Shelnut, thank you very much. I think um, questions and comments, maybe uh, we'll reserve them till the deputies have spoken on this issue so we get everybody's point of view and then perhaps some of the command team or uh, may want to respond. Um, and we have uh, uh, Miguel in person. <clears throat> like Mr. Ingalls, I also have uh, witnessed what happened at uh, Lampert Stadium at, uh, at Trinity Bellevue Park. It's surprisingly when the violence that occurred at Trinity Bellevue Park, uh, but, uh, John Tory and uh, former Chief uh, Mark Sanders uh, say on, on, at the end of the meeting that they went through several hours of body-worn camera to, to see if there was any signs of sounds of violence towards people, and they claimed that there was none. In less than two days, they reported back. So that's incredible. Anyway, I'm here to speak about um, accountability. And, and one of the things I have discovered is that uh, community safety unit officers, uh, when you have a complaint against one of them, um, all the complaints are directed to this building, uh, to the office of the gentleman over there, for review. Um, and then they're sent back to uh, TCAC investigators. So this, uh, Consider Lily Chen, you will find it very interesting how the, the complaint process you know, that we discuss at the board is working or not, because it seems that um, what with, without the absence of uh, body-worn cameras, uh, video evidence, um, it's, it's absurd to believe that the investigations are proceed correctly. Um, you see, um, in two years, there was uh, 500 and, no, 859 public complaints, 640,000 interactions with the public. And the complaint pro, uh, minimized to 0.05% represent the documented contacts made when, uh, um, through the body worn camera system. It helps investigators to, to whether to decide there were some um, breaches of the code or breaches of the, uh, the code of conduct or the training, et cetera, et cetera. So my advice to uh, DCA Toronto Community Housing, please, Ensure that your uh, body, uh, your community safety unit officers are provided with body-worn cameras, because of my experience that I have uh, had in July 4th, 2023, um, a officers came to uh, 220 Oak Street and uh, they arrest me, and in the process my human rights were violated. Um, I was in need of uh, uh, personal support, and when it was denied, so. This is a very complex. I'm not. Um, I, I'm wondered, I wonder if the uh, in, op, the opposition to the body worn cameras that is coming from the union, the OPSU union, and the anti black racism anti uh, strategy can drop it. This this opposition to the body worn cameras for CSU officers because we really need to ensure accountability and transparency of the officers who get well paid. Um, and they cannot get away with lying under oath, as it has happened many times, and you can hear from different lawyers when they gone into trial, and they discover, sadly, that the officers were lying. So again, um, my recommendation is please, uh, go back to your uh, board of TCAC, request them, that uh, the, the CSU officers must be provided with body-worn cameras, just as the TTC special constables are going to be the, uh, provided with body-worn cameras. Um, so, 
um, in, in conclusion, I just want to say that uh, the complaint process is very um, unfair for any civilian. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of energy, it takes about all your um, savings that you have in, um, in your bank account to fight, uh, to hire a lawyer, to, to fight the, the, the Toronto police, because they have $1.2 billion to the disposal. They have the, <clears throat> the, Toronto, the city of Toronto solicitor office. They have their union. How is it possible that we can win when we have all these people against us? How can we ensure that our citizens are protected? How can we ensure that we have fairness in the process? So hearing that, uh, um, um, when I said that um, I have contacted the office of um, the mayor, Olivia Chow, yes, this, this, document, this in, uh, video, com video that is being recorded will be forwarded to the attention of the mayor, Olivia Chow. And trust me, I cannot wait to hear who is she's gonna choose to be the next um, representatives of the council at this board. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, the next deputy we have is Derek. So I've, I found this in an item that was considered by executive committee on May 2nd, 2023, and was adopted without amendment titled remuneration and expenses of members of council and of council appointees to agencies, corporations, and other bodies for the year ended December 31, 2022. At its meeting June 2014, City Council adopted amending the constituency services and office budget policy so that eligible legal fees would include fees related to, among other things, investigations conducted by the Toronto Police Service related to councillors' duties and responsibilities, excluding criminal investigations and access requests for councillor records. So um, I hope the Toronto police don't mind because you know, there are people down at City Hall that would like to defund you. Um, one day I'd like to actually see, uh, hold you guys accountable and get a copy of what those investigations uh, came up with. Because uh, I'm not quite sure if um, most members of Toronto City Council actually know what their duties are. They're nowhere listed in the uh, City of Toronto Act. Um, as you probably know by now, Chair Morgan, I um, ma mailed a notice for full disclosure to Colin here in care of yourself. And um, I just wanted to mention uh, Vickery versus Nova Scotia Supreme Court, 1991. Supreme Court of Canada said in Cox Broadcasting Corporation versus Cohn, the U.S. Supreme Court stressed the importance of the public's right to know the contents of public records. Um, there's a federal court of appeal case that speaks of um, the accountability of all those who exercise public power. It's uh, Democracy Watch versus uh, Attorney General of Canada, 2022. Tyranny, despotism, and abuse can come in many forms, sizes, and motivations, major and minor, large and small, sometimes clothed in good intentions, sometimes not. Over centuries of experience, we have learned that all are nevertheless the same all are pernicious. Thus, we insist that all who exercise public power, no matter how lofty, no matter how important, must be subject to meaningful and fully independent review and accountability. So it just so happens the definition for accountability in Black's Law Dictionary is simply the state or quality of being answerable to somebody for something, responsibility. This is R versus Boulanger, 2006, where the Supreme Court of Canada said, public officials are therefore made answerable to the public in a way that private actors may not be. Uh, in Black's Law Dictionary, answerable is defined as, there's three definitions. Three, giving rise to enforceable liabilities certain to incur legal responsibility. One, required to explain one's actions to someone with more authority. Remember, Premier Ford said uh, when he um, did the council cut crisis that uh, you all work for the same people. We all have the same boss, the, the people. Two, capable of being replied to accurately and intelligently, having a correct response. Uh, this is from the Toronto Police Services Board, 2021 Information and Privacy Commissioner of Ontario. The police submit that they exercise their discretion and that it should be upheld. 
They say that they acted properly and that they balanced the privacy protections in the act with the public's right to know. This is Central Auto Parts versus Barclay, 2016, the Ontario Court of Appeal said, as in Webb versus Waterloo Regional Police Services Board, standard police media practices and policies and the public's right to know have to be considered. This is from Endine versus British Columbia, 2016, where the Supreme Court of Canada talked about the public's right to know the law and to understand its application. This is from Gilles E. Neron, Communication Marketing versus Chambre de Notaries uh, de Quebec, 2004, Supreme Court of Canada said, the public's right to information is embodied in freedom of expression and freedom of the press. The public's right to be informed and the pub right to freedom of expression with respect to issues of public interest. Uh, the public's right to know and the role of the press in discovering and getting the facts out into the public domain even though on occasion, as here, the presentation of the facts leaves something to be desired. And there's actually in the Dictionary of Canadian Law a definition for public's right to know. The right of members of the public to be informed about the operations of government and public officials. Because um, I know some people don't like it when I show up at City Hall and uh, I ask questions and they tell me that I can't ask questions because there's a rule. But whenever I've asked them for the rule, uh, they actually end up getting rather angry with me. So if Toronto police ever get called on me regarding that one day, you know that uh, investigate at least on what the rule is that says we can't ask questions down at those city hall meetings. Thank you. And lastly, um, on uh, item four, we have uh, no Connor Angles. I, th I think we're going to hold our questions and comments till we heard from everyone on the same uh, topic area. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you for having me today and providing me the platform to discuss some of the concerns I have with respect to police accountability. I'm here to tell my story of disappointment with the system. I filed a complaint with the OIPRD as I witnessed misconduct at the encampment clearings on July 20th and July 21st of 2021. My conscience compelled me to report what I perceived to be inappropriate and violent behaviors on behalf of the TPS. However, despite a thoughtful and well-detailed multi-page complaint with accompanying picture and video evidence, I had been screened out as my complaint was not in the public interest and I was too far, being, too far removed as being a witness and not a victim of the violence. I appealed and received a division court order that forced the OIPRD to screen in my complaint and investigate the allegations. Only one allegation was investigated and it was substantiated. My account of what happened was corroborated by body-worn camera video evidence. However, the rest of my complaint, which details even more severe allegations, was once again not investigated. Despite a judge's order specifying that my complaint must be screened in and a good faith investigation must occur, as a result of this ordeal, I can no longer trust the TPS or the OIPRD and the accountability system as a whole. I found my experience to be incredibly disheartening, disturbing, and really demoralizing. In order to provide a better understanding, I can go into a little more detail for you. To begin, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I work as an English tutor. I'm a full-time student at OISE for a Master's of Teaching, and it's my dream to become a kindergarten teacher. I'm just a regular civilian who heard about the encampment clearings on social media and felt obliged to go bear witness. So on the morning of Tuesday, July 20th, 2021, I rode my bike to Alexandra Park to simply observe the homeless encampment clearing. I was simply standing there when an officer approached me in an incredibly hostile way he was out of control and very aggressive. He demanded that I leave even though that I had not said a single word. Later, the TPS would find that what transpired between myself and Officer Kiproff on July 20th, 2021 was misconduct and he was reprimanded for our verbal interaction. The following day, I witnessed the same officer on a rampage, beating people with batons while their backs were turned. I saw him shoving and throwing people uh, who were non-violent and unthreatening, spraying a can of pepper spray into the crowd, including on his fellow officer. And I also saw him beating 
Um, another innocent bystander, unconscious with the baton, and full force shoving another innocent bystander. I witnessed all this as I stood in the fenced off areas. I was listening to the instructions of the officers and I never antagonized. All I did was observe. My conscience compelled me to look further into what I witnessed as what I saw horrified me and traumatized me that day. I had never experienced anything like that. In the aftermath, I looked up videos on social media from trusted news outlets and, I, and what I found confirmed what I had seen. What I saw, corroborated by these images, still haunt me to this day, and I've been deeply affected by this. I filed a complaint with the OIPRD. I, it was a 200-page-plus dossier, complete with videos, photo evidence, notes, uh, relevant code of conduct, uh, conduct violations cited, and even though I did my best to provide the, uh, the investigation with photo and video evidence, they treated me like a pest and refused to investigate and take this evidence serious. I was initially screened out as not in the public interest, which forced me to go through a lengthy appeal process, find two lawyers who would take the case pro bono and waive tens of thousands of dollars for me. The appeal was successful and it resulted in a judge's order that told the OIPRD my complaint had to be screened in. Even with the judge's intervention, the end result was that only the least important fraction of my initial allegations were investigated. I was disappointed to learn that I was excluded from the officer's disciplinary process. In sum, the accountability system has failed me and is positioned in a way that will not be accessible to others who are not as fortunate as me to receive pro bono representation. This lack of accountability has unfortunately resulted in the total erosion of my trust and faith in the TPS. I can no longer say I would seek out help from the TPS or I'd be able to trust them in any way moving forward. Police accountability is integral to the governments of any democratic state as the police must earn the public's trust in order to elicit cooperation and compliance. Faith in the police promotes public safety. Mistrust of accountability systems can result in mistrust of the police themselves and in turn makes governance more challenging. Therefore, I call on the board to perform a complete audit of, by non-police third parties with respect to accountability system generally. Additionally, I call on the board to investigate TPS actions with respect to encampment clearings. And I'd just like to thank you for your time, your consideration, and the platform to discuss my issues with the broken police accountability system. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ingalls, for sharing that your experience. Questions, comments, uh, as it related to you, um, either the presentation by Staff Superintendent Code or the deputant? All right. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Ingalls. Um, now, may I have a, a motion to receive both the presentation by Staff Superintendent Code and the report from Chief Dempke as it relates to professionalism and accountability? Actually, I have a question. Oh, please. With regard to the what is the process that you this, and I'm just wondering. Do we just listen and make a note, or is there a pathway to have a further meeting with him? First of all, I think it was a, a complaint uh, to the OIRPD, um, uh, Mr. Shellnuts, his counsel, um, and I'll, I'll defer to legal, but I think the board probably doesn't have that ability to um, engage in uh, an investigation of a provincial body of the OIRPD in terms of uh, their non-responsiveness to uh, to the uh, the issues that were raised uh, about Lamport Stadium and the uh, inappropriateness of the police officers that, that were the form of the allegations. So I don't know, Council, if you can help me there with that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. very large part of what has been dealt with or, or we allege not dealt with uh, involves uh, TPS professionals. Yeah, I wonder, thanks Mr. Shelnut, maybe our council can come and use the microphone uh, uh, so she can actually comment on the question uh, of Councillor Chang was what, what can the board do? 
through you, Madam Chair, um, to the Councillor. Um, the Chair is correct. The, there, is a, there is a statutory body which has been explained through the presentation, and the complainant has gone through the complaint process, including judicial review, um, and so there isn't a role for the board with respect to this complaint. But I, I do thank you for your presentation. I'm mindful of your comments because the board obviously does have oversight in terms of, of policies as they relate to training, as they relate to, um, you know, um, initiatives. Um, so um, I uh, do take your comments very seriously, and I'm, I'm thanking you for coming out, uh, and as well uh, for uh, Mr. Ingalls to, to share his experience uh, with us. So thank you. Chief, if, if we're if we're ready to uh, if, if the board's ready to proceed with uh, receiving the report, I just wanted to take a moment and thank Staff Superintendent Code and his team uh, and the incredible work they did. First of all, putting the report together, but notwithstanding what the last few minutes uh, we discussed, which I completely understand those perspectives, um, we also heard about some incredible work done by people who made great sacrifice. Uh, serving the city of Toronto, so I just wanted to make sure I acknowledge the work of the team to put the report together and importantly acknowledge the women and men of the Toronto Police Service that are represented in that report uh, who conduct themselves in an incredibly professional way, in a brave way, in a courageous way serving our citizens, our residents. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, and may I have a motion then to receive, as I indicated for the two uh, um, reports. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Crisanti, seconded by uh, Member Mig Migliori. All in favor, <laughs> seeing no one opposed, it's um, carried. Um, the next item is item 10. Um, item 10 is uh, as it relates to uh, a public complaint by Mr. Uh, um, Sean Jacka. Um, um, first, uh, uh, and thank you for your patience, Mr. Jack. I'd just like to make a motion to allow Mr. Jack to come before the board and to speak. He, um, he will have 10 minutes and he can uh, explain his situation. So we have a motion in order to hear Mr. Jack. Uh, Ms. Gestack is seconded by uh, Ms. Spencer. Um, please uh, proceed and we'd like to hear from you. Thank you, Mr. Jack. Thank you and good afternoon. I appreciate this opportunity to speak to you today. Um, as I'm sure all of you are aware, bicycle theft is endemic in the city of Toronto. Uh, and as a result of my dealings with the police um, in connection with my stolen bicycle, it doesn't appear that the police have a handle on the situation. Um, I was disappointed and unimpressed with the police handling of my case as I'm sure that anyone else in a sim similar circumstance would have been. Um, and so I'm hoping you'll take this opportunity as a supervisory board to look at the matter and recommend some changes, uh, take the opportunity to make some changes uh, within the way police handle these matters. Um, and I'd ask you to, uh, if I might, to consider what would the current bicycle theft and recovery landscape currently look like if 15 years ago the police had taken the opportunity to do the following. First, set up a police uh, task force dealing with bicycle theft. Two, establishing connections with online person-to-person -person resellers. So you can think of eBay, Kijiji. Three, set up data exchanges between the police force and these online reseller systems um, so that they could compare uh, uh, police theft reports with online listings. The fourth step that could have been implemented was to uh, bring political pressure but encourage slash require online listings to include serial numbers. Very simple, very simple step and then obviously compare the police theft reports with online listings and the serial numbers of online listings. Um, such an approach would yield tremendous investigative results with a minimum of allocation of resources. We've talked today about police resources being scarce. Almost everything I've suggested is automated. 
So there will be a little bit of a learning curve. Systems would have to be put in place to do this, but not at great expense. Um, but, but the indirect benefit of this is that it would make it much more difficult for thieves who are selling bicycles online to be able to do so because they obviously don't want to put serial numbers and start tying themselves to specific stolen uh, property online. So the indirect benefit, of course, is with reduced opportunities to fence stolen goods, there will be reduced theft, which again reduces the um, uh, police resources dedicated to addressing thefts within the city. I've also made some suggestions in my report um, or in my request for review um, for the board to consider um, issues such as the online filing system. I had an experience uh, in trying to file my initial police report. Um, the system failed. Um, and, and the reason it failed is because while the system ostensibly allows you to file uh, images and pictures with your police report, uh, the system, when I used it, crashed, um, and it, it ejected me out of the system. It, it erased all of the data that I'd already entered. This was the last step in the process, um, and this is a waste of time. Now, in the response, um, Detective Petrie's response, he's indicated that, uh, or see, he's, he's addressed my, my concern, um, but he hasn't addressed it substantively. Uh, Detective Petrie noted that there is a facility for people to email images and they'll be stored in the system, but that doesn't address the failure at the online filing stage. Um, so there's no reason that the online filing system should continue as is if in fact it's just kicking people out of the system. Um, it's fairly standard for systems to indicate whether or not a particular data file is acceptable to the system. Uh, I wasn't flagged with that, just to be clear. Normally, um, when you try to file something that's not um, accessible, to the system, it will tell you that it can't accept this particular file, um, and then you'll have to find a workaround. That didn't happen in my instance, and I'm assuming that I'm not the only one that has uh, struggled with um, these uh, filing issues. Again, should be easily corrected, and if the system can't deal with it on the first end, remove that. Give people a notice to say, once your case is assigned, you'll get an email and you can file uh, forward any uh, additional documentation directly to that individual. But that seems to be a fairly simple matter to address. Um, I, w I think one of the things that, that, that uh, I noted was a stark contrast between the prioritization of bicycle use in a political context and the allocation of resources from the city of Toronto. Bicycles are prioritized in terms of expenditures, but the, the police response to my experience was that bicycles do not appear to be a high priority in terms of uh, uh, responding to theft reports. Um, and I think that disconnect could be addressed uh, somehow, whether, whether that's an allocation resource issue, again, my suggestions that I've, I've made in my uh, um, written submissions to you provide numerous opportunities or, or considerations for how the uh, process can be improved. But I don't think that improvement requires a tremendous um, uh, imposition from a financial perspective on the police, but uh, a prioritization uh, and an understanding culturally that this is something that could be important, um, uh, could be improved. Um, And I wonder, too, since we know that thousands of bicycles are being stolen across the city every year, those are the reports, the reported thefts. How many bicycles are not being reported to the uh, police because people don't have faith in the way that the police are going to respond? Um, so I think we shouldn't assume that the, uh, the stats that we know about in terms of the reports of thefts are, in fact, the actual numbers, that's, that's the baseline. So probably bicycle thefts in Toronto are much larger than we know about, simply because people won't report uh, because the process itself is not particularly streamlined. Um, I've also made a couple of comments in my, uh, in my submissions to the board that um, the communication process is not great. 
Uh, I think people do not understand how their files are being handled. Uh, when you file a police report, it, at least my experience seems to be, unless I actively try to engage with the police, you don't hear from them. Um, and even when you try to express your concern that something is uh, time sensitive, because again, my bicycle, just to remind any of you, my bicycle was stolen between the Sunday that I last used it. It was posted online of the Wednesday of that week. I found it the following Sunday, I reported it immediately to the police, and it was uh, sold uh, all within the span of about a week. So all of that happened within the span of a week. So thieves are quite well aware of the opportunity to dis uh, dispose of bicycles um, through the online reseller system. Um, and so we need a way that, that the police can respond expeditiously to these. I appreciate this is not the same as a, a bank robbery, um, but that doesn't mean that it's not something that should have been looked at in a timely fashion. Um, but uh, again, it just seemed that all of the uh, steps in the process were not set up for responding expeditiously, even the online filing system. Um, the information that I was trying to provide might have assisted the police in allocating um, my file to someone who was prepared to respond in a timely fashion. But again, since my uh, file was rejected by the system, um, it was very difficult for me to get that information to the police, and they didn't ask for it, even though I'd flagged in my report that I couldn't file my uh, online images through the online system. Um, so at the end of the day, I hope that you'll uh, take the opportunity, uh, again, to uh, reject the report that the system is fine. It's not fine. It could be improved. It doesn't have to be improved with lots of money. The police could uh, take the opportunity now to put in process that they should have done a long time ago. Online selling has been around for two decades, and the police still don't seem to have any experience in dealing with this space. That's my experience. Um, that's, that's what I saw. And so, again, I'd like to encourage the board to uh, recommend changes. Thank you, and I appreciate, Mr. Jackie, you came and you uh, uh, gave us your input as it related to your particular dealings. I just wonder if I could ask the chief or anyone of the command team, is there, as a result of this particular complaint, has there been any updates as it relates to perhaps uh, um, Mr. Uh, Jackie's concerns? Um, so as the uh, chief information officer, a lot of the technology stuff falls to me. Um, and uh, personally, um, uh, uh, my son's um, Rocky Mountain just got stolen out of um, our backyard. Um, and so um, obviously being in the position I'm in, I went through that process um, and, um, and uh, found the technology clunky, um, difficult to use. Um, and it, I can tell you off the back end that it's not connected to uh, eBay, Kijiji, um, or other, so uh, other data sources like that. Um, our challenge is, um, is to get to that kind of digital state of crime solving, we need an investment in technology. Um, and uh, so my three and a bit years here um, have been trying to lay a, a, a framework and a roadmap to get us there. Um, as I said earlier in this um, meeting, we've uh, gone live with the parking complaints portal, which is a technology template to replicate in other areas. Um, there's also been efforts around bicycle registries. Now the issue is when you buy a bike, um, you might be using it in the city of Toronto, but you might also use it in York, Durham. You might take it up north. Um, so you don't want your bicycle registries to be tied to a police service. You want them to be um, global um, and then referenced by police. Um, and we've had a number of conversations with city of Toronto um, around that. Um, unfortunately, the talks broke down. Um, uh, different stakeholder groups were not supportive of the police having access to that information. Um, and it's absolutely necessary to our work. So we, we have some, um, some work in that direction and some challenges, and I think um, uh, advocating um, for uh, changes in legislation to have serial numbers um, as part of uh, uh, postings makes a ton of sense, um, and it would allow me to hook into something to create automation um, in, the, um, uh, in the investigation process. May I respond? Is, is that appropriate? So yes. We, we can also take this offline, sir. Um, sure. Uh, and, and I can sure. I can get into greater depth with you. I think I think one issue I, I want to be very clear though that um, the the issue of registering serial numbers and and licensing bicycles that has nothing to do with my complaint. 
I realize that's another data source for you to consider. I'm not talking about that. I know what my bicycle serial number is. I provided that to the police. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, I'll say no, who the online reseller was. Um, as Detective Petrie's report indicated, um, this individual had several questionable listings on Kijiji. But he appears to be not apprehended by the police. I don't know that the police are doing anything further. Um, and so, as I say, at the end of the day, I've given a data point, um, and, and this is something that could have been done 15 years ago. It's not that difficult to match some of this data. I, I realize you could be talking about a vast infrastructure um, investment. I, I don't think it requires a vast infrastructure investment to send reports to contacts at Kijiji or eBay. Uh, I don't think the scripts are that complicated, but uh, I will let you take the official position and that's fair enough, but you haven't tried yet. And so until you try, you don't know what you're gonna get back. Um, and, and that's my frustration as a, as a citizen. It doesn't appear that any of those steps have been done and it's been around, for, the technology's been around and the opportunities for online reselling have been around for decades. So the police have missed the boat on this and I'm asking the board to say, no more missing the boats because failure to address this issue has led to the current problem and uh, a failure to make changes now and to require changes now, like officially yeah, require changes now will we'll continue the problem. No, I do, I do understand um, and it'll be an issue of whether or not the board uh, will uh, be satisfied uh, of the way that the Toronto uh, police have handled it or whether or not we ourselves will, uh, you know, engage in a further investigation. So thank you for uh, your comments. So I believe now we have a motion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I move the motion that uh, the board one concurs with the chief's disposition of uh, service complaint to PRS zero eight nine seven two four that the deficiency identified by the complainant was a result of a human error and not an issue with the overall service or police policies of the service and that the chief has acted. Uh, to rectify this matter in a sufficient manner. And point two, direct the executive director to notify in writing the complainant, um, the chief of police and the independent police review director of this decision with the above reasons. Motion uh, is then carried, and I believe uh, that was the last item on our agenda. Um, uh, can I have a motion to adjourn? <laughs> At, okay, Vice Chair, what? Yeah. Oh. Um, and as well, uh, we had a motion uh, as it related to the motion for item number 10 and approve the, uh, uh, the actual item number 10, the presentation. <laughs> yes, I have Member Kostakis and I have Member Spencer. And we've, have a, we've had a motion to adjourn. Next board meeting is September 14, 2023. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.